and our, we have a, a program, one program, then we have some information about the League of Women Voters Lake Michigan region, which we invite you to stay for to hear about us and all the things that we do. And then we have a second program and we should be done around 1230. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will have, oh, there's Liz, I see. There was one person, I, uh, hi Liz, welcome. We'll make you a co-host. Um, uh, Liz, I'm going to introduce Liz Solberg and she is the League of Women Voters of Indiana Natural Resources Chair and she will introduce our speakers, our speaker and then Nancy Moldenauer and Barbara Hargrove will be handling the question. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz Solberg. Thank you, Liz, for uh, joining us today. All the way up and down. You should be able to, let's see, where's Liz? Uh, you're, you, you haven't unmuted. We have to start all over again, Liz. It's, sorry, Liz, I, I thought you were unmuting me. <laughs> I, I, I thought I did, yeah, no. There's a, there's <laughs> a lot of trusty girl. So let me, it, it bears important repeating about a big thanks uh, to the League of Women Voters Lake Michigan region for bringing us these really important webinars. Uh, and after such a positive message of solution yesterday, uh, that informative and encouraging glimpse into smart sewers in South Bend, uh, we turn today to significant environmental challenges facing our beloved Lake Michigan. But as you say, uh, let me first mention uh, that I am a Greater Lafayette, Indiana League member, and along with Lisa, whom you met yesterday, and then Jeanette Nagu, whom I think most of you know, <laughs> uh, as well as Christina Lindborg uh, in Bloomington, uh, we form, as you mentioned, I mean, the advocacy coordination team for, as the League properly says, natural resources issues. That goes back to the, the 1970s, you know, before we use environmental terms there. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, we, uh, this is for our, our advocacy team for the League of Women Voters of Indiana. And I should just say, if any of you who are Zooming in this morning and aren't, if you aren't part of our electronic environmental group here in Indiana and would like to be, just pop your name and email into the chat box and we'll be glad to uh, add you to our group. All of us who work on environmental issues here in Indiana deeply appreciate the remarkable leadership of the Hoosier Environmental Council. We are honored to have with us today HEC's Dr. Indra Frank. And yes, doctor means medical doctor <laughs> who specialized in pathology until she was drawn into a, a career shift in 2004 focused on environmental health. Indra has a bachelor's in biochemistry from Pomona College, an MD from Johns Hopkins University, and then a master's in public health from Indiana University. She worked in environmental health programs, education, and policy, including seven years teaching environmental health and environmental toxicology at the IU Fairbanks School. Um, those of us from Indiana know Indra and so appreciate her incredible work as the Director of Environmental Health and Water Policy for the Hoosier Environmental Council. Uh, Indra will take us today into the treacherous realm of environmental challenges for Lake Michigan, Northwest Indiana, and around the lake. Thanks again, Dr. Indra Frank, for bringing us your expertise. Oh, thank you, Liz, um, for that um, very kind introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you this morning and a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I'm going to uh, share slides because uh, some of these environmental challenges are best illustrated with photos. Um, so bear with me for just a moment while I bring my slides up. Uh, hmm. <clears throat> All right, that should be showing now. Great. Um, I'm sure as, as many of you know, the lake has many environmental challenges. We won't be able to cover all of them. Um, I will be uh, talking about coal ash and then some of the others 
that we deal with in here in Indiana that are um, shared amongst the Lake Michigan states. As Liz said, I'm with the Hoosier Environmental Council. Um, the council has been around since 1983, working for a cleaner, healthier environment and sustainable economy for Indiana. Um, we are a not-for-profit uh, uh, organization. So I have the privilege of working with this marvelous team of folks um, at the, the Hoosier Environmental Council. And coal ash is a, a big issue uh, for several of us at the, at the Hoosier Environmental Council. Coal ash, of course, is the material that's left behind after burning coal. There are the four types of coal ash that are illustrated here on the uh, screen, depending on what part of the power plant you, you uh, take the ash from. Um, there's a lot of coal ash. 6,849,800 tons of it were produced in Indiana in 2018. That's the most recent year for which we have full data. Over 100 million tons per year are generated nationally. Um, this is one of the largest industrial waste streams um, in the United States. Uh, where is coal ash? Um, of course, this slide just illustrates Indiana. Um, the red triangles represent sites that either currently have or used to have coal-fired power plants. And there are four such sites along Indiana's Lake Michigan shore. Um, two of those uh, still um, are still active to some degree, Michigan City and Bailey. One of the things that this slide helps illustrate though is that our power plants are always next to a water source. Coal-fired power plants need to have a source of cooling water. So they tend to be either next to uh, Lake Michigan or next to one of our uh, major rivers. Coal ash disposal um, can take several different forms. One is that the coal ash can be used. The best use for coal ash is in cement or some other similar uh, form that locks the, the contaminants in the coal ash away. Um, if it's going to be disposed of and not used, it can wind up in a landfill or in an impoundment. And the coal ash impoundments are also known as coal ash ponds. This photo shows a coal ash landfill at A.B. Brown, which is a power plant on the Ohio River in Southern Indiana. And to help with the scale um, that we're looking at here, over to the left, we have uh, mature trees. So that helps you to see just how large these, these landfills can, can be. Um, the white material showing here is the form of coal ash known as FGD waste. Um, this is a photo of a coal ash impoundment at Tanner's Creek, um, a little closer up. So you just see a portion of the impoundment, but you also see how the ash winds up in the impoundment. When water is used to rinse the coal ash out of the power plant, um, that process is called sluicing. And here we see the Tanner's Creek coal ash being sluiced into uh, the coal ash impoundment. These impoundments can be massive. Um, this photo shows cold ash impoundments at the A.B. Brown plant um, in southern Indiana. Um, the power plant is here on the left. You can see the, the smokestacks. In front of the power plant, there's a black sort of triangle. That's their coal ash or their coal pile, excuse me. That's the unburned coal. In the foreground, there are two irregularly shaped um, areas of turquoise, white, and gray. These are the coal ash impoundments. They look sort of like lakes. They cover 164 acres to a maximum depth of over 50 feet. It's estimated that these impoundments hold more than 5 million tons of coal ash. That's not an atypical amount. There are coal ash impoundments in North Carolina that exceed 10 million tons. The environmental problems that come from coal ash can be summarized with these three words, spills, dust, and water. So let's take a closer look at some of those. Um, this is a photo of a coal ash spill in Kingston, Tennessee in 2008, when the coal ash covered about 300 acres. 
caused a massive fish spill and threatened a drinking water source downstream for Chattanooga. Um, these spills happen with coal ash impoundments when the structure of the impoundment or part of that structure fails and releases this, this mix of coal ash and water. There was also a major spill into the Dan River in North Carolina in 2014. Um, uh, that was estimated at 39,000 uh, tons, if I, rem if I remember right. We've had a few spills in um, Indiana. The biggest were into the White River uh, when a total of 60 million tons or 60 million, uh oh, I think it was gallons, uh, spilled into the White River in central Indiana from the Eagle Valley uh, power plant. These coal ash spills um, have, of course, a, a um, smothering effect on the landscape and on the river bottom or lake bottom that they land on. Um, so they damage the aquatic ecosystem with that smothering effect. Um, they also put contaminants into the water. And then dust. Uh, this is a picture of coal ash dust at a landfill in Oklahoma. Unfortunately, coal ash dust can be as fine as one micron in size, and that's small enough that it can be inhaled all the way into the small air sacs of the lung and even be absorbed into the bloodstream as the blood vessels pass through the lung. Fine particulate uh, of that size, of course, exacerbates respiratory disease, um, but it can also contribute to a higher risk of cardiovascular events like heart attacks or strokes um, within the, a short time period of exposure to the, the fine dust, fine uh, particles. So we've looked at coal ash spills and coal ash dust. Um, next, I'd like to spend some time talking about coal ash and water. Coal ash has uh, heavy metal contaminants in it that can contaminate water. So the best way to deal with coal ash is to keep it dry. Um, so in this illustration, we have a schematic of a coal-fired power plant. That's the gray uh, sort of series of structures here in the background. Um, in front of that, uh, just a graphic to represent a landfill. If a landfill doesn't have a liner under it, then if that uh, ash gets wet from precipitation, um, the contaminants can be picked up by the water and moved downward into the groundwater. So a landfill can contaminate groundwater. Um, if water that's been in contact with the ash in the landfill is collected, that's referred to as leachate. Um, and in some cases, the leachate is then piped into nearby waterways. Um, as I mentioned, uh, coal ash can also be rinsed out of the power plant with water. So we have some pipes here that represent that process with the ash being sluiced into an ash pond. If a coal ash pond doesn't have a liner under it, then that contaminated water can move downward and contaminate the groundwater. Um, and I'm not sure whether it, it shows for you in, or not, but the, um, the excess water on, uh, as the ash settles, the excess water at the top of the pond um, is moved off of the pond and usually discharged into a local water body like Lake Michigan or the local river. Those, those are the ways that the coal ash contaminants can get into water, either groundwater or surface water. Um, so let's look at a particular example. This is the Michigan City Generating Station that's on the shores of, of Lake Michigan in Michigan City. The photo shows Lake Michigan here in the, in the upper corner, right, the large turquoise area. This is, of course, an um, aerial photo. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see part of Michigan City. And above that, in the upper right, here's Trail Creek um, as it enters Lake Michigan. The power plant is right next to Trail Creek here. Here's the power plant buildings. Um, and the power plant, plant property is separated from Trail Creek by this straight line, which is a, a sheet pile wall along Trail Creek. And then you can also see there are straight lines along the power plant's property line with the, with the lake. So there's sheet pile wall along here and then along the shore uh, here, this sort of diagonal uh, line, the sheet pile ends 
uh, oh, around down here, which is near the, the cooling tower. Um, the large uh, pond structure that's uh, on this uh, photo, let's see, um, here, sort of triangular shaped one, um, NIPSCO refers to that as the final pond. It receives uh, excess water or used to receive excess water off of the coal ash ponds, um, and it also receives some storm water. The coal ash impoundments are the irregularly shaped um, gray areas. Let's see if I get control of my mouse back. There we go. Uh, the irregularly shaped gray areas below the triangular final pond. So here's the final pond. So this area uh, is a coal ash pond, this little rectangle, this area, again, a, a rectangle, and then this area here. So five coal ash ponds that contain a total of about 170,000 tons of coal ash. Those coal ash ponds are no longer used by NIPSCO. Um, they're currently uh, moving all of their truck or coal ash by truck to the landfill that they have further south at the Schaefer power plant. Um, when these coal ash ponds were being used, they would let the ash settle until the pond was full, and then they would move the ash to uh, a landfill elsewhere or um, sell it for reuse. Um, so those uh, coal ash impoundments have had groundwater monitoring, and they have um, contaminated the groundwater at the Michigan City Power Plant. They've contaminated it with arsenic, boron, lithium, molybdenum, selenium, sulfate, and thallium at levels that exceed the health standards for drinking water. So I've included the list of what the health standards are for drinking water in uh, milligrams per liter. And next to that, I've there's a column of the highest concentration that was detected at the Michigan City Generating Station. Um, and what you can see, if we, for example, if we look at arsenic and go across the rows, the drinking water standard is 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. The highest concentration detected at Michigan City was 0 0.058, so more than five times the drinking water standard. For boron, um, the Michigan City groundwater has nearly twice the drinking water standard. For lithium, it's three times the standard and so forth. Um, the contaminants that are found in groundwater at coal ash sites vary from one site to another depending on where they got their coal and uh, what kinds of pollution controls were present at that power plant, um, what forms of ash were sold versus what forms were put into an impoundment or a landfill. Um, but these are some of the ones that are common, uh, particularly the arsenic, boron, lithium, molybdenum, and sulfate. Those show up at a lot of the coal ash sites. Groundwater, uh, it turns out, does not hold still. In this diagram, we see the Michigan City uh, site, again, from the air. Um, and in this case, we have blue arrows that indicate the direction that the groundwater is moving in. And what we see is that groundwater at the Michigan City site is moving into Lake Michigan and Trail Creek. So that contaminated groundwater is moving into our surface water. The effect on the surface water or the aquatic species that live there has not been fully studied. Um, that's one of the things that we've been pushing for in Michigan City. We do know that arsenic from the coal ash is accumulating in some of the sediments uh, immediately adjacent to the power plant property. And once uh, arsenic is in sediments, it can move up the food chain and wind up in fish. The Michigan, so Michigan City has an impoundment closure plan. Um, under the federal coal ash rule, once a coal ash impoundment has contaminated the groundwater, um, the utility is required to stop putting coal ash into that impoundment and close it. And in this point, in this instance, closure means um, taking the ash into a final disposal form. And Michigan City, they're proposing closure by removal. They're going to remove the ash and take it to a lined landfill that they have further south at Schaefer. And that landfill is not in the floodplain. As I mentioned before, the best thing we can do when we dispose of ash is make sure that it's not in contact with water. 
So the fact that this landfill has a liner underneath it will help protect the groundwater. Um, they'll be building a cap over the coal ash as they fill the landfill and that will protect it from precipitation. So as coal ash disposal goes, uh, this is the best option for the coal ash that's, at, that's in the impoundments at uh, Michigan City. Um, unfortunately, the coal ash that's in the impoundments uh, is not all of the coal ash that's present there. Um, and this is true of many coal ash sites and I'm sure it's true of coal ash sites in our other Lake Michigan states. There can be coal ash uh, that is not that does not fall under the federal coal ash rule, which is unfortunate. Um, at Michigan City, there's a good deal of coal ash that's being held out of Trail Creek and out of Lake Michigan by their sheet pile wall or, or sea wall. And this is a photo of a segment of the Michigan City sheet pile wall along Trail Creek. So this steel sheet pile wall um, extends, I think, as I mentioned before, um, along Trail Creek and then along the entire uh, lake shore next to the power plant property. These are aerial photos from 1951 and 1961 that help give a sense of how much coal ash um, is actually present at the Michigan City site. Um, so in the 1951 photo, we can see the, the border with Trail Creek and it doesn't show well, but there's a coal ash impoundment right here uh, next to Trail Creek um, that's essentially being held in by the, the sheet pile wall. And then we see the other sheet pile wall, this triangular shape um, that at this point at, in 1951, basically just had water behind it. Um, so here's Lake Michigan off to the, to the left. And then you have water of Lake Michigan that's separated by the sheet pile wall. And you can see the, the beach, the sandy beach still present um, in the 1951 photo uh, next to the water. In the 1961 photo, you can see that they've started to fill in that section of water that's behind the sheet pile. And here we have a large gray area that's uh, coal ash. So they were filling in behind the, the uh, sheet pile wall with coal ash. According to their documents from 1931 to 1972, coal ash, soil and sand were used to fill in behind the sheet pile wall. So I've, I have the 1961 photo here again, so that you can compare it to today's photo in uh, 2020. Uh, by the early 70s, they had uh, between 10 and 20 feet of this fill material behind the sheet pile. And that created what they call made land. This is not the only site along Lake Michigan where uh, land was made with using fill in, in this way behind sheet pile. On top of that made land, uh, they built uh, an extension of the power plant uh, here next to Trail Creek. So we've got more buildings and parking lots on top of the old coal ash impoundment. And then the, the current day coal ash impoundments were built on top of the coal ash fill. So unfortunately, that coal ash fill um, exceeds the amount of, of coal ash that's in the uh, coal ash impoundments. We don't know the exact number, but even if we do a very conservative estimate and say, well, perhaps the fill was only 20% coal ash, um, that, that amount of coal ash would still exceed the amount that's, that's in the impoundments. I suspect it's a good deal more than that. Uh, based on the photo we have from 61 that shows all of this coal ash uh, going into the, the area outlined by the, the sheet pile. Um, there's a, another issue that we uh, have to look at at our, at our coal ash sites, and that's whether the coal ash is being disposed of in the floodplain. Um, here at Michigan City, um, this photo shows that same aerial view and you can kind of make out where Final Pond is, that triangular shape that's next to the, the lake shore. Um, this turquoise swath represents the 100 year, the estimated 100 year uh, flood. So there's a chance of a flood this large, approximately 1% per year. And it's referred to as the, the 100 year floodplain. 
along Trail Creek, you'll see that, that there's the flood area is marked in yellow. That's to represent floodway, meaning the area where the floodwaters move the fastest. Um, again, the best thing we can do with coal ash is to keep it dry. So disposal of coal ash in the floodplain um, is problematic and it's happening uh, it, at many sites and could be happening in uh, the other Lake Michigan uh, states as well. So to, we can sum up the health and safety issues from the Michigan City coal ash this way. Um, dust, when the ash is dug up and moved, that's certainly a concern because this site is, is placed right in uh, the city and that dust could affect residents as well as the workers who are, who are uh, busy excavating the ash. Ash contaminants seeping into Lake Michigan and Trail Creek from the contaminated groundwater. Third, uh, continued groundwater contamination after the ash ponds are removed because of all the ash that's buried at the site as fill. And then a coal ash spill if the sheet pile wall were to fail. And these sheet pile walls uh, you know, started to be built in the 1930s. They were added between about 1931 and 1950. So they are aging um, and starting to show uh, signs of age um, in, in their most recent in inspection. We do have a federal coal ash rule um, uh, to help us with coal ash disposal. Um, its official name is the Coal Combustion Residuals Rule and that's often abbreviated the CCR rule. It is the first uh, US regulation of coal ash disposal, despite the fact that we've been burning coal in this country since uh, the 1800s. It, was it wasn't finalized until 2015. So prior to that, states had the option of creating regulation about coal ash disposal. Um, many of them either did not or, or had fairly weak regulation as we had here in, in Indiana. This federal coal ash rule uh, from 2015 started to be weakened uh, in 2018. So starting in 2018, we've had four different proposals from the current EPA to weaken the coal ash rule, um, the, largely with, with um, provisions that delay the closure of these leaking unlined impoundments um, and some loopholes that we fear could allow use of the coal ash impoundments uh, despite leaking for um, many years to come. Um, the federal coal ash rule is self-implementing. This is an unusual term. Um, it means that the utilities are responsible for following the rule themselves, but the EPA is not providing oversight and it is not providing enforcement. In 2016, Congress passed a law uh, allowing the EPA or authorizing the EPA to uh, take on enforcement of the federal coal ash rule with a permitting program. Um, but since then, the EPA has not actually written up that, that uh, permitting program. They did put out a, a draft, but it has not been finalized yet. So that leaves the CCR rule as self-implementing for now. The only legal mechanism uh, for forcing a utility into compliance, if that utility is not in compliance with the coal ash rule, is through citizen lawsuits. And that's why uh, not-for-profit organizations like the Hoosier Environmental Council and Earth Justice and Just Transition Indiana have been paying such close attention to our local coal ash disposal sites. Um, And in order to uh, allow citizens, you know, enough information to, or, or not-for-profit organizations, enough information to potentially watchdog these coal ash sites, um, the rule does have a provision that each coal ash site must post information online. So coal ash sites near you uh, should have a CCR webpage on which they post the required documents about their groundwater monitoring, about the inspections of their impoundments and about their closure plans. Um, to find the, the um, coal ash website for your power company, 
you can search for um, in, in your internet browser, the name of your coal, uh, your power company and the abbreviation CCR or the name of your coal, your power company and coal ash. And that should bring you to their, their website. If it doesn't, another way is to go to the EPA's uh, webpage for coal ash internet sites. If you, uh, the URL was kind of clumsy, but if you uh, search in your internet browser for EPA coal ash internet sites, that will pull up uh, EPA's full list. So those are ways that you can find information about coal ash sites near you. Um, you can also find out where coal ash is disposed of um, through this website that was put together by the national not-for-profit organization, Earth Justice. Um, the URL is listed here, uh, but an easy way to get to this same webpage is by searching for coal ash map. Um, that, that pulls this map up and it's possible to zoom in on the map and click on the individual dots to get information about the coal ash sites that are near you. And as we can see, there are coal ash sites in all of the Lake Michigan states. Um, Earth Justice also put together a toolkit for advocating for coal ash cleanup. And this is especially important now because over the next year or two, um, a large number of our coal ash impoundments are going to start going through the cleanup process. Um, I included the URL here, uh, earthjustice.org forward slash coal ash forward slash toolkit. Um, but if you were to search for Earth Justice Coal Ash Toolkit, I'm sure that you would also find it that way. This is really an amazing tool. It includes instructions on how to find um, the information that you need um, to, in order to advocate for good sound coal ash cleanup. And that, again, that means keeping the coal ash dry and out of the floodplain. Um, it also has model letters that you can use to write to uh, your state environmental agency or to the utility uh, in the process of asking for this cleanup. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move from coal ash uh, to other environmental challenges that we share in the Lake Michigan states. Um, in particular, uh, issues that we've seen at the Indiana State House that are shared amongst these states. Um, each year, the Hoosier Environmental Council keeps a close eye on the bills at our state house that would have an impact on the environment. And part of my job is keeping an eye on all of the bills that are related to water. And of course, that means they're also related to Lake Michigan. Um, so a few notable bills from uh, the legislative session in 2020. And I, sh I should comment here that um, Indiana has a part-time legislature. Our legislature meets for the first three or four months of, of each year. So the 2020 session ended just before uh, we all had to go into uh, isolation because of the pandemic. In 2020, we had uh, a bill that reduced wetland protection, uh, which is unfortunate. And of course, wetlands are important for Lake Michigan and for all of our, wet, our waterways. They uh, filter and purify water as it passes through the wetland. They're also very good at storing excess water. So when there are uh, large storms and an excess of precipitation, wetlands can hold um, large quantities of water and that reduces flooding downstream. Many wetlands are protected under the Federal Clean Water Act, although the number that are protected was reduced recently by the EPA. In Indiana, there's a law that protects the wetlands that are not under the Federal Clean Water Act. And it was that law that was modified by SB 229 in um, 2020. Our, one of our state senators, uh, Senator Victoria Sparts, authored this bill um, to ease the wetland protection when it comes to our um, county surveyors and the drainage projects that they engage in. So it makes it easier for them to engage in a drainage project that might injure a, a wetland. We also had a, a bill passed about the shore of Lake Michigan in Indiana, House Bill uh, 1385. What this did was codify uh, parts of a decision made by the Indiana Supreme Court uh, in the Gunderson 
uh, versus the state uh, case. Um, this puts into Indiana law a provision that says that the state owns the, the um, lake bottom up to the ordinary high water mark and holds uh, that, that land in trust for citizens of the state. That means that from the water line up to the ordinary high water mark, that portion of beach is public property. Um, and the, this bill also protected uh, various public uses uh, like swimming, walking, uh, uh, canoeing or, or fishing along uh, these segments of the Indiana shoreline. Um, this, uh, the lawsuit and then the, the bill came about because there were some private property owners who unfortunately um, were told when they bought their property that the property uh, extended all the way to the waterline. Um, and uh, that is not the case. Um, and apparently the, this public as aspect of the shoreline uh, for Indiana has been um, uh, a matter of policy since the state was founded. So now we, we actually have it codified into law that uh, the, the shoreline up to the ordinary high water mark is, is public. PFAS, we had a bill passed about PFAS. Um, it prohibits the use of PFAS containing firefighting foams during training. This is a good thing. Um, PFAS are a family of chemicals that are perfluoro or polyfluoroalkyl substances. That means they have fluorine atoms attached to um, uh, some carbon uh, backbone. Um, so like I said, a family of chemicals, they're used in uh, many, many products uh, along with firefighting foams. Um, and as a result, we are seeing uh, sites with groundwater contamination from the PFAS, and this is becoming an issue for drinking water. I know that Michigan has taken steps to address uh, PFAS in drinking water. Indiana has started looking at some of our drinking water systems to assess whether PFAS are, are a threat. This is an issue that we're going to continue to see um, over, over the next few years. There was a bill proposing annual uh, inspections for confined animal feeding operations in Indiana. Uh, this one did not pass. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, confined animal feeding operations produce vast quantities of manure that are stored uh, either in ponds like we see, or lagoons like we see over on the right-hand side, um, or get spread on the, on the land as fertilizer. And unfortunately, if, if the lagoons or the spreading are not handled properly, we wind up with manure winding up uh, into our waterways uh, and that can wash into Lake Michigan and contribute to bacterial contamination. So this one's been introduced uh, several years in a row and hasn't had any traction. Um, Indiana has relatively weak um, regulation of our confined feeding operations. So what might be up for the Indiana legislature in 2021? Um, this is going to be a budget session. Our legislature writes the budget every other year. Uh, and the discussion this year will be difficult because of uh, the um, COVID induced recession and the, the loss of funds to the state. The Hoosier Environmental Council will be working hard to try to get restoration of um, the agency budget for the Department of Environmental Management. Pardon me. Our uh, Department of Environmental Management uh, had a, a big budget cut during the 2008-2009 recession and their budget has essentially not been restored since then. So we are currently operating with um, 100 fewer people than our, our environmental agency had in 2005. So in 2005, uh, about 900 staff and they're currently operating at about 780 staff. This makes it harder to enforce the environmental regulations in Indiana, harder to have uh, sufficient staff for inspections and uh, pollution prevention programs as well. We anticipate a bill about carbon sequestration. This is a surprise for Indiana, um, a very conservative state where the words climate change uh, are virtually never heard in the state house. Um, 
it turns out there are uh, Indiana corporations that are working to reduce their carbon footprint and they are interested in uh, carbon offsets that they could purchase in state. So uh, we have legislators working to put together a bill that would create carbon offsets through forestry projects or through projects uh, where farmers build organic matter in the soil. And of course, if you're building organic matter in the soil, that stores uh, carbon in the soil. So we're looking forward to, to that, that bill. Um, and we may see a, a bill on septic inspections, a bill that would increase inspections of septic systems in Indiana. Um, this bill has been introduced each of the last uh, couple of years um, and may return. It hasn't had much traction yet. Uh, Indiana uh, residences uh, approximately, um, excuse me, there are approximately 200,000 uh, failing septic systems in Indiana. That's an estimate from our state health department. Um, but the, the full number is not known and uh, the measures to get those uh, leaking septic systems uh, in, in, under control are, are fairly weak for our state. So it'd be, it'd be good to see this discussion come back. The Hoosier Environmental Council posts information on Indiana's environmental bills every year. Um, and we uh, provide information about those bills in our um, e-newsletter, our email newsletter. Um, it's possible to sign up for our e-newsletter at our website, which is hecweb.org. The newsletter goes out once or twice a month during um, most of the year. And then during the legislative session, it goes out once a week because things can change very rapidly with the bills at the state house. And it gives Indiana voters a chance to see what their legislator uh, is up to that would have an impact on the environment. Um, we also maintain a Bill Watch webpage. Uh, this is a photo from Bill Watch 2020. And of course, there will be a Bill Watch 2021 uh, for the bills uh, that come from our legislature starting uh, in January. Every year, the Hoosier Environmental Council holds um, our annual conference in November. Uh, so just a, a month or so prior to the beginning of the next legislative session. And we discuss the important policy issues that we anticipate in the in the, the coming session. This will be our 13th annual Greening the State House. Uh, it'll be November 20th and 21st. Um, of course, it's being held virtually this year. Um, uh, and there's information on how to register at hecweb.org uh, forward slash GTS. Everyone's welcome. Um, the conference has sold out each of the last five years with as many as 550 people attending. But um, this year, since it's virtual, we actually have capacity for even more than that. And, and who knows how many people will attend. We have a, a really awesome um, platform for doing the virtual conference. And so, I mean, I'm really going to miss being able to see people in person, but our virtual platform does have a really nice um, mechanism for networking, for allowing people to network during the conference. Um, and finally, of course, you can find the Hoosier Environmental Council on social media as well as on our, our website. Um, and with that, I'll uh, stop my screen share. I realize I might've gone a little fast. I'm actually uh, ending early, um, but Nancy, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. I think you were going to um, start on to our, on our questions. Um, yes, um, Barbara Hargrove and I will be um, reading the questions as individuals enter them into the chat box. Um, we have several already, but please, um, if you have any questions um, regarding Endo's presentation or um, anything regarding coal ash or the Great Lakes region and pollution. Um, we'll try to deal with those the best that we can. Um, Barbara and I will be going back and forth. So um, I'll ask the first question here. Um, this is from Lisa Harris and Lisa asks, does the coal ash contained in concrete get released into the environment with wear and 
tear and or when it is crushed for other purposes? Oh, that's a good question. Well, um, I don't know all of the details, but I do know that engineers at the EPA studied um, coal ash being put into concrete or bricks or cinder block, you know, other forms of, of uh, sort of pavement, you know, where it's, where it's solidified like that. And my understanding from the EPA report is that cement really is one of the best ways of controlling the contaminants from, from coal ash. That even if that cement is broken up uh, into smaller bits, um, the coal ash contaminants remain kind of bound up so that they, they won't get back into water. Um, there, unfortunately, there are other uses of coal ash that do not prevent the contaminants from getting into water. And this is something to look out for. Um, I mentioned one during my talk, coal ash has been used extensively as fill material, both on PowerPoint, power company properties, but also on um, private property as, as we saw in the town of Pines in, in Indiana. Um, it's been used as roadbed and uh, there, some, of, some of the uses of ash, particularly when it's used as fill, do not protect water resources. Um, another problem we've had with, with use of coal ash or so-called use, beneficial use, uh, was uh, power companies placing it into old coal mines to try to fill up the mines. And of course, those mines go deep enough to have contact with the groundwater. So basically this dumps the coal ash straight into the, gold, the groundwater. Um, so yeah, the, the phrase beneficial use is something to watch out for. If you start reading about your local coal ash, the only use that's truly beneficial is when the coal ash is locked away uh, in, in what's called an encapsulated use, like cement. Thank you, Andra. Most excellent answer. Um, Barbara, will you take the next question, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. What is the current status of the sheet tile wall on the shores of Lake Michigan in light of the high water level fluctuation? That's an excellent question. Um, I have heard from private individuals that they've seen waves actually crashing up over the, the um, sheet pile wall during storms. Um, in a recent uh, public meeting, NIPSCO answered this question by saying that the sheet pile wall undergoes you know, regular inspections by their staff and on a, I think every other year basis, they have um, a, a third party come in with engineers and inspect their sheet pile wall. The most recent inspection that I'm aware of was in 2018 um, and it gave the oldest sheet pile along Trail Creek a fair uh, rating and the sheet pile along Lake Michigan, which is somewhat younger, um, a good rating. Um, uh, you know, NIPSCO has made statements, uh, you know, about their commitment to maintaining the sheet pile wall. Along the, the lake shore, they actually have two sheet pile walls separated by, I think, five or six feet uh, distance from each other just to, for added protection. And I think there's sand between the, the two layers of, of sheet pile. But this does raise another, another issue. Um, coal ash is a forever pollutant. These are heavy metals that are, that are in the coal ash. And heavy metals don't break down over time. I mean, they can move, like when groundwater picks them up and moves them, but, but they don't break down. Um, and sheet pile is a man-made structure that does not have a forever uh, lifespan. Um, so I, I am worried about leaving that amount of coal ash in the Lake Michigan floodplain with, uh, you know, just sheet pile to, to hold it back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Cheryl Chapman. And the question is, the federal coal ash rules just been loose in October 16th. Does Indiana have its own rules to protect us? It looks like they're allowing places like NIPSCO to determine whether or not they are polluting the groundwater with unlined coal ash ponds. Yeah, well, actually I'll, I'll start with that, that last question about the groundwater. 
the utilities are required by the federal rule to monitor their groundwater at coal ash disposal sites. That's one of the best things that that federal rule did. We now have systematic groundwater monitoring at all of our coal ash sites. Um, and what it shows is, you know, more than 90% of those sites have groundwater contamination. Um, and then the first part of the question was about coal ash rules in Indiana. We have some regulations um, that apply to coal ash that predate the federal coal ash rule. They weren't written specifically about coal ash though. So Indiana has regulations about waste impoundments. It also has regulations about waste landfills. And those regulations do apply to Indiana's impoundments and landfills. Um, unfortunately, they did not have stipulations about where you place your impoundment or whether or not it's lined. So how the impoundments were built and where they were built was not controlled. So most of Indiana's coal ash impoundments are in the floodplain of either Lake Michigan or one of our, our major rivers. Um, uh, the vast majority are unlined. And even those that have liners don't have liners that meet the, the current standards under the, the federal rule. Um, Indiana announced in 2016 that it was going to start writing its own coal ash specific rules. But this year, um, largely because of the pandemic and the loss of, of staff or the, the low staff numbers at our um, state environmental agency, they have discontinued the effort to write an Indiana specific uh, coal ash rule. Um, so they will continue um, to uh, evaluate the closure plans for coal, for coal ash impoundments and they will continue to regulate landfills as they have in the past, um, but we will not have a coal ash specific uh, Indiana rule. Rosemary, uh, Barbara, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Um, do you have a number of how many coal ash plants are on the shores of Lake Michigan? I know you probably know Indiana, but overall? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm afraid I, I'm only familiar or you know closely familiar with the ones in Indiana. So in Indiana, um, there are four coal ash sites right next to the, the lake. One of those, the state line uh, power plant that closed a number of years ago, um, I've been told by our state environmental agency that all of the ash there was removed. Um, anyway, um, hard to know for sure because state line is a site where uh, they built out into the lake with made land. And um, I, I don't know if if that made land included uh, coal ash. Um, and then there's cleanup going on at the closed power plant at Mitchell, which is in Gary um, as, as well. And I'm sorry, I, <clears throat> I don't know about um, lakeshore or lakefront power plants in, in other states. Can I ask you, for those of us who live in Hammond and Northwest Indiana, mm -hmm. um, we've been wondering about that because they went ahead and it was very quiet how they built the new building over the supposed, you know, cleaning up of the area. Is there any way that we can find out if that area was truly cleaned up? I mean, I, I, I don't mean to get off on a tangent, but I, I'm just, I have a lot of people who are really curious. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an excellent question. I looked into it um, starting a couple of years ago because of the proposed new building at State Line. Um, and the best I could get uh, from the documents that are available was that they had an ash impoundment. Um, they hauled all the ash to a landfill. Um, and I don't know of any drilling that was done on the site to see if there was coal ash buried. Um, our, and our state environmental agency simply told me, oh, st all the ash was cleaned up at state line. Okay, thank yeah. you, appreciate it. Our next question is from Cheryl Chapman. Do the four um, Great Lake 
I'm sorry, do the four Lake Michigan states have an emergency plan for cleanup if there is a big spill into Lake Michigan? Oh, that's an excellent question. This is another good thing that the federal coal ash rule did. It required each of the utilities to write an emergency plan uh, for their coal ash sites, their coal ash disposal sites. So if you go to your power company's coal ash website, you should be able to find their emergency plan. They should also have documentation of how they are meeting with local emergency personnel on an annual basis. Um, their emergency plan is supposed to include a map showing the estimate of where a spill would go if their coal ash impoundment has a failure. So they're required to write those plans. Um, and fortunately, they're, they're also required to meet with local emergency personnel. Okay, next question. Um, what about threats of or oil spills from um, pipelines that pass through the Indiana corridor? Oh, that's, that is a really good question. Um, I'll share what I know, but it's limited because it's an issue I haven't worked on. Um, we do know that over the history of pipelines in the United States, they leak, they have spills. These are also pieces of human infrastructure that, that don't last forever. Um, I looked at, at one company that has a pipeline across Indiana, not up in the Lake Michigan region, but uh, uh, in the center of the state. And they had had some kind of leak roughly every year, uh, you know, for the last dozen years. Um, so I, yeah, I, I worry about pipelines, um, but like I said, it, it's, it's not an issue that I've, I've spent time on. Um, this question is from Tricia Denton. In general, are you seeing any difference between national and local trends in water protection policy and or enforcement? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. There was a study released just last year by the Environmental Integrity Project looking at um, uh, enforcement trends under the Clean Water Act. Uh, it's an excellent study. Um, and it shows that, of course, at the federal level, we've had um, multiple uh, proposals to weaken um, regulations that protect our, our waters over the last four years. Um, uh, it, it also shows that, you know, despite the EPA's statements about freeing up the states to have more flexibility and take on their environmental uh, problems themselves, um, the majority of states um, uh, actually have a relatively, well, I forget actually what how, how exactly how they worded their conclusion. Um, it's not, I, I think it was that the majority of states either had, um, you know, lower budgets than they've had in prior years or lower staffing that they've had in prior prior years. So that was that was a, a, a report that I'd, I'd recommend. Environmental Integrity Project. Um, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't think of the title of it off the, off the top of my head. But certainly at the federal level over the last four years, we've, we've seen um, multiple attempts at deregulation uh, weakening regulations that protect our waterways and uh, uh, lack of enforcement. You're putting it mildly. Uh, this question is from Rosemary. We have an old coal plant here in Illinois in Waukegan and our lake water levels are constantly rising. What happens if the lake keeps rising? Oh, good question. And that brings up a point that I, I failed to mention with the previous question about the lake rising. Um, groundwater uh, rises as the lake rises. So you, if the lake is high or you know, if your coal ash is next to a river, if the river is high, 
that means that the groundwater next to that body of water will probably also be higher than it would have been during a, a dry period. Um, you know, groundwater elevations do fluctuate over time. This can be a problem at coal ash sites where they dug their, their coal ash impoundment as a, as a pit. Um, so picture a pit that goes down 10 or 20 feet into the ground that you start filling up with, with coal ash. And now as the groundwater elevation goes up, it might start to get into that coal ash. And now you've got coal ash actually sitting in the groundwater. Some of these pits in Indiana were dug deep enough originally that the coal ash is sitting in the groundwater year round. Um, and at others, they're proposing to, to close the coal ash in sight, meaning just build a cap over the old impoundment. And we're worried about that because that means there's nothing protecting the groundwater underneath. And as the groundwater rises, like when the lake rises, the groundwater can come up into contact with the coal ash again. Um, so yeah, one of, one of the things that we'd, we'd really like to see is coal ash taken out of the unlined impoundments and put into lined disposal on high ground out of the, the floodplain um, so that we don't have to deal with, with these changes in groundwater level. Or when you've got ash disposed of in the floodplain, and I don't know at Waukegan whether it's actually in the floodplain of the lake or not, but when you dispose of ash in the floodplain and then the water rises, you could start to um, erode into the impoundment or into a closed impoundment uh, and that poses a risk of releasing the ash into the surface water. Um, so yeah, the, the rising lake level um, is also an issue for coal ash. For all of us, thank you. Um, this next question is from um, Representative Pat Boy. Steel mills with blast furnaces use coal to make coke for the basic oxygen furnaces. Do they have coal as residuals? And if so, what are they required to do with it? Oh, Representative Boy, I'm glad you're with us today. Um, and thank you for your commitment to environmental issues. Um, that's an excellent question. I am not aware of ash accumulating at sites that make coke. I do know that we have had Superfund sites that used to be coke plants. So these are dirty operations that can leave behind soil contamination and groundwater contamination. Um, to my knowledge, they are not regulated under the coal ash rule. The coal ash rule stipulates that if you're generating more than a certain number of tons per year of coal ash that you're um, you know, obligated to follow that, that rule. Um, I, yeah, so I'm sorry, there's a sort of, sort of a gap in my knowledge there. I don't know of Coke plants actually making coal ash, so. Uh, this might kind of be a follow-up. The 49 landfill has pollutants and heavy metals migrating down from the site into the groundwater around it near Valparaiso. It was a dump site for steel mills and other industries. There's a coalition working on it, but what do state and federal law say about this? Okay, so yeah, for landfill sites or dumping sites where there are soil contamination and groundwater contamination problems, um, those fall under the Superfund law um, as well as um, a law that's referred to as RECRA. It's the Resource Conservation, uh, wait, RECRA, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, I think. Um, and we actually have some sites with coal ash fill that are being addressed under uh, RECRA or Superfund, like in the town of Pines, where fill, you know, coal ash fill is, is being dug up. Um, for, so for landfill sites where you've got other kinds of contaminations like from the steel industry, um, it would fall under uh, RECRA and under the Superfund law. Um, Thank you. Yeah. This question is from Tricia Denton. Is there a problem with excessive nutrients in the Lake Michigan watershed? And if so, 
Okay, it just jumped. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, and if so, are the sanitary districts removing the nutrients? Oh, good question. Okay, um, I do spend some of my time on nutrient pollution. Um, so nutrient pollution would be excess nitrogen or phosphorus getting into our waterways. It's a problem because it causes algae blooms and those algae blooms can deplete the oxygen in the water leading to water that can't host fish or other aquatic species. Um, there are excess nutrients in um, most of Indiana's waterways. So I suspect we have them in the waterways that drain into Lake Michigan as well. Um, our confined animal feeding operations contribute to excess nutrients. So do leaking septic systems. Um, our wastewater treatment plants do to an extent, although their discharges um, do fall under regulation of the, the Clean Water Act. Um, so any place we have a treatment plant that's treating household uh, wastewater, um, they probably have limits on the amount of nutrients that they're allowed to release into the waterways. That doesn't mean it gets to zero, so they're still contributing, but at least the amount that they're contributing is uh, regulated under the Clean Water Act. Thank you. Um, this is a question I, I have. Um, I believe I read this in Alliance for the Great Lakes. Is it true that, in, that we have until 2038 to clean up the coal ash? Is that a federal or is that a state? Oh, um, okay, so. Or am I mistaken? Yeah, so, okay, this, <laughs> the, the deadline is in a state of flux. Um, the EPA did manage to finalize some extensions on coal ash cleanup, um, and there's enough of a loophole in, in these new provisions that we're worried that it, it could delay uh, cleanup quite a ways on, on some of our coal ash impoundments. Um, the year 2038, I'm not sure about. Um, some of our uh, coal-fired power plants have announced that they're going to retire, and it's possible that, that 38 is the retirement date for, for uh, a power plant uh, near you, and that would mean at least that they're going to stop generating new coal ash. Okay. Um, the original coal ash rule would have had um, impoundments that are in an inappropriate location, like floodplain or, or in contact with an aquifer um, or impoundments that are, that are documented to contaminate the groundwater, it would have required them to close by, I think, 2023. But uh, like I said, that's been pushed out. Um, and in fact, the deadline to stop putting coal ash into uh, leaking uh, inappropriate impoundments has also been pushed out. And that, that, sorry, and th that was at the federal level. Um, there are some states that are going much further than the, the federal um, coal ash rule. In particular, North Carolina and Virginia have very strong coal ash laws of their own. Um, Michigan has a coal ash law that I think in some ways goes further than the, the federal. And I know that Illinois has passed a law that goes further than the federal in that it requires better public engagement about coal ash cleanup and it requires um, better assessment of what the options for cleanup are. Um, I think the details on implementing that, that law and turning it into you know, the state's regulations uh, are still being worked out for Illinois. So in Indiana, it kind of depends on, on where you are and what, what plan that you have then what you're saying. Right, so for, for Indiana, um, our coal ash sites are regulated under the federal coal ash rule. Okay. Um, and then there are some sites that are being addressed under RECRA, like the coal ash uh, fill and landfill in the town of Pines. Um, and then our impoundments that start going uh, into closure 
that closure process is being regulated by the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. So um, our environmental agency, state environmental agency is looking at closure of the impoundments. But as I said earlier, they didn't have any regulation about where the impoundments were built or how they were built originally. Our last call um, will be from Luann Burton. And she asks, are you familiar with the coal ash situation at Canadian plants along the Great Lakes? Oh, I'm afraid I'm not. Um, it's possible that they're covered on the Earth Justice coal ash map. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not familiar with what's going on in Canada for coal ash. Um, Indra, I want to thank you for a most excellent presentation and your outstanding in-depth answering of our questions. It's been a joy and truly an inspiration to have you with us this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words, Nancy. Thank it's been a pleasure to be with you. All right, now uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about the League of Women Voters Lake Michigan. I'm gonna turn this over to Cheryl Chapman, who is the uh, chairman of the conference committee. So Cheryl, we want you to take a little bow. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. And uh, Cheryl Chapman, are you? I think I'm still muted. There we go. Okay, yeah. Hi. Well, thank you everybody for showing up. This is so fantastic. I'm so glad this is going, um, that we're recording it and hopefully we'll figure out how to archive it onto our Lake Michigan League of Women Voters website. Um, it's just great to see all your smiling faces here. Wow, what a crowd. Um, I'm going to introduce Dahlia Gigas, and um, she is a local city councilwoman. And let's see what you've got in store for us this morning, Dahlia. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. I am currently a councilwoman in Michigan City. But the start was really with the League of Women Voters. When I moved here in 2013, I joined the League and that was an excellent networking opportunity. I met so many people and gotten so involved in so many organizations since then. Uh, so I've been active in League, I've been on the board for a while and I still help out you know, when I can with the League. I've also attended a couple of these conferences which are always excellent. And so uh, what else do I wanna tell you here? Oh, so I wanna tell you our conference is the good, the bad, right? And the ugly, let's talk about some good. So if you recall, four years ago, we had the Lake Michigan League conference here in Michigan City, and I did a Trail Creek environmental restoration tour. And so I thought maybe you'd like to revisit that and kind of see some of the projects we did. I haven't updated it. It's actually up on my website for all time until I take down the website, but I really would like to share, uh, you know, some of the photos from that lovely field trip that we did. So let me see if this works here. And I think it's gonna go forward. So yeah, maybe you'll see yourself, maybe you'll see people that you know, I'm sure you will. So um, like I say, this is a, we went around and saw the different projects done by the county, done by the city, and we have a big collaboration called the Trail Creek Watershed Partnership, which has governmental agencies and fishermen and all kinds of people involved working on projects for Trail Creek. So we don't have very much new happening right now, except for the Carwick Park Nature Park. So that's going to be opening up soon. But otherwise, it's really hard to even meet together, as you probably all know. So I don't know, let's take a look at some of the pictures, just revisit ourselves from four years ago. That's at the county park, that's Jeremy Sobecki. So anyway, we're still active as much as we can be during you know, the COVID uh, time period. And so you know, besides me, I know Pat Boy is here and Pat Boy is uh, House District 9. She was also very active in our local lead. I don't know if she wants to give a shout out and say hi, I see pictures of her in there too. Pat, do you wanna say anything? Um, let me make sure I unmuted her. Uh, I might not have. Let me find her name. There she is. No, I will unmute her. There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, I remember that trip. That was a really interesting trip. It was really cool to see the uh, 
those orange balls down there are the uh, eel barrier because we have a salmon stream here. Uh, learned a lot. I've learned a lot through the league. It's been a great experience. I haven't been as active lately, but nobody has been either. <laughs> so I don't feel too bad. Um, well, you guys have been, but um, I've been more or less isolated this summer. It's frustrating. Um, this this was a really great trip. We learned a lot of stuff at the at the at the event and then and the on the tour too. That's all. All right. Well, like I say, I hope you enjoy seeing people, you know, people that maybe not, not around anymore, but uh, people that had a good time on our little field trip. So uh, what I want to do is, so my next job is to introduce the president and have the president's report about the Lake Michigan League's activities from last year. So if we can, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Dahlia. Hi, I'm Krista Graham. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters Lake Michigan Region. I also am so happy to see so many people turn out for this um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to make, I, I want to thank Indra as well. You, Indra, you are a terrific communicator and also um, to um, reiterate something that Nancy said, um, I was reminded as you were answering questions of the time that Kevin Schaefer, who is the executive director of the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sanitary Sewage District, I think is the is the organization, where he told us that he had never been grilled as hard as as he <laughs> did by our league audience. So you know, congratulations, you made it through a really tough morning. Um, I also want to thank um, our our organizers, um, especially the co-chairs Barb Hargrove and Cheryl Chapman. They were very disappointed when we had to make this a virtual conference this year, but um, they, along with all the other members from Indiana Leagues, regrouped and organized this um, virtual conference and, and it's been wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, another, the, another thank you that I'd like to give is really personal and that is to our vice president, Rosemary Heilman, who is manning the board this morning. Um, but uh, more than that, she really had to step up quite a bit this year to an extraordinary degree um, to help the Lake Michigan League get through um, a period where I was, I had some illness and so she stood, you know, she did more than would normally be uh, required. So I really appreciate that. And as has already been noted, We've had an unusual year this year, as everyone has. Um, and it's also been a year of transitions for us. We have a 20 member board of directors and every state league has four representatives and then we have four elected officers. Um, and we had four people resign from our board last year. And I would like to publicly thank them for their contributions to the Lake Michigan League and for their years of volunteer service to us. So I'd just like to recognize them. I know many of them are on the call. So we have, um, thank you to Ruth Caputo from um, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, Lou Ann Burton from the LWV Sheboygan. Julie Arneth from LWV Green Bay, Wisconsin. And Marjorie Pallion from LWV um, Ozaki County, Wisconsin. Uh, we also have, um, we added five new board members this year. So that is a quarter of our board turned over in the last year. Um, and so I'd like to publicly recognize them. Trisha Denton from LWV Leelanau County, Michigan. Nora Kelly with LWV Milwaukee County. Mary Beth Nawar from LWV Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, Illinois. Uh, Donna Prepacall, and I, I apologize to Donna because I'm sure I mispronounced her name again. Um, she's from the LWV Downers Grove, Woodridge, Lyle, Illinois. And um, just appointed last week, Susie LaBelle from LWV Wilmette. So she has not yet had you know, an official um, role on our board, but um, uh, we're very ha happy that she has stepped up to fill the opening 
among the Illinois representatives. And I think that um, it's a good time to remind everyone that if you're interested in our activities, we do have a number of volunteer um, opportunities. You, besides being a, a representative for your state league, which we always seem to have some openings for those positions. So that is one opportunity for a way for you to get involved. But we have committees and, um, and even just some of the smaller tasks for our, our annual meeting, you know, things like serving on our budget committee or serving on our bylaws committee. Um, we have many opportunities for volunteering. And if you'd like to be more involved with us, please reach out because we would welcome you with open arms. Um, another transition for us this year, um, and it is really important, is that we started to have our quarterly board meetings via Zoom. And um, I'm sure that many people have moved their meetings to Zoom, but it's really important for us because we had board meetings that had to travel 600 miles to attend our board meeting, you know, being an organization that covers four states. Um, so we had tried it in the past and we didn't have as much um, uptake where people were not that um, willing to participate, but the COVID-19 has forced us to um, move, you know, take, use the technology that's available. And it makes it much easier for people to be board members. Um, so that's actually a good outcome. Um, as for, well, our main activities are education and advocacy, just like with every league. So um, as I said, it's an unusual year for us. As far as education goes, um, this has been the first event that we've really been able to have um, for members. Um, so, and again, I thank everyone for putting, pulling this conference together. On the advocacy front, we've been keeping, uh, we have been able to be pretty busy. Um, and um, we are having our actual annual business meeting next month on November 14th. And it's going to be via Zoom and people can attend that. And maybe we can go into more detail on our advocacy activities then um, but I've been told to keep it short, so I'm going to, you know, kind of gloss over things. But at the federal level, we do a lot of our advocacy with the Healing Our Waters Coalition, and we have continued to be active with them. So we signed on to several letters this year um, asking the federal government to take action to stop water shutoffs um, for people who could not pay their bills, especially in light of um, COVID-19. And we, of course, as we always do, we supported in, um, continued and increased funding for water infrastructure. We also signed on to a letter opposing weakening of the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which is very concerning. Um, uh, another, we have also been very active in uh, working with the state leagues this year to take actions on state matters. Um, Trisha Denton is a board member from Leelanau County, as I said. She is our representative to the Oil and Water Don't Mix Coalition in Michigan, which we just joined this year. And um, so we have been taking, um, we took action on several items with them, um, opposing Enbridge's Line 5 and, and the permitting process there. Um, and, and again, as I said, maybe at the annual meeting, we'll have time to go into a little more detail. And then we also have taken action in Indiana um, where we signed a letter commenting on the consent decree with US Steel regarding their permit violations um, with the hexavalent chromium uh, discharges. Uh, so this is, I'm, I'm very happy about, you know, working with the state leagues um, and local leagues in the states on local matters like that. Um, the, we are an interleague organization and we were formed to do collaboration. So it's great that, you know, we can, um, these kinds of actions pull our leagues closer together. So um, that is, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say. So give me a second. I think that's it. So um, uh, with that, I will cut myself short and uh, introduce Joy Guscott Mueller, who is our Education Committee Chair. 
Thank you, Krista, and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much. It's so great to see all of you today. And I am going to give you a brief report about what we've been doing as an education um, committee. Um, we have restructured some of the committees and the board has a really robust committee structure uh, now that we've been working on. And the education committee, of course, has been dealing with the pandemic as well in terms of how we go about educating uh, our members. And you, some of you may know that uh, the education committee has had a robust speakers bureau that has engaged in many presentations in person throughout this region. Um, we have quite a menu of offerings to give to various leagues and, and community organizations. So you can call on our speakers bureau to present presentations such as how green is the, the water, um, rooting for clean water, storm water from the ground up, whether you should use the water, the Clean Water Act and the future of our freshwater resources, Flint type water hazards, uh, addressing technical and legal aspects of lead con contamination, current water related issues in each of the respective states in the um, Lake Michigan region, the Great Lakes, various challenges and solutions that we are all facing, um, PFAS presentations and emerging Great Lakes um, issues. So this is just a, a handful of the offerings that the Speakers Bureau can provide to you and your leagues. And it's a program that's ready to go. And what we have been working on now is working as a, a committee to make sure that the members of our Speakers Bureau and those folks who have expertise in the league who might want to give a presentation, educating them and training them on how to use the Zoom platform, um, sharing um, various documents that they may wanna share with a group uh, so that it runs as smoothly as this uh, program has run, thanks to the efforts of the Indiana folks and Rosemary Heilman and her expertise as a Zoom administrator. And so uh, that's what we've been working on and we just reach out to us uh, and we will be delighted to work with you on presenting an offering that will work for your league and address some of the things that you all want to learn about. You know, we believe that advocacy and education, of course, go hand in hand. The first step in advocacy is educating folks that a problem actually exists and what's involved in educating them in this regard as to the science and what can be done. And so we're really committed to not only doing advocacy, but educating folks so you all can become great advocates in your respective regions. And Cheryl also asked me to provide um, a, just a summary of the advocacy committee report. Krista has touched on that. And the chairman of the advocacy committee is David Mueller. And he is um, an environmental lawyer. And he's right here because he also happens to be my husband. <laughs> Uh, and so David just wanted me to share with you that um, that the spring and, and summer was a busy time for the Lake uh, Michigan Region Advocacy Program as the current federal administration has really accelerated its agenda of deregulating the EPA. Um, and so in addition to providing comments um, on the Council of Environmental uh, Quality's proposal to weaken the NEPA regulation that Krista mentioned. Um, the, the Advocacy Committee also provided comments on EPA's censoring science rulemaking that will weaken multiple environmental laws and regulations 
by restricting the scientific bases that can be used to justify environmental regulation. The committee also provided multiple letters of support to the Great Lakes Congressional Delegation and Committees supporting the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, clean water infrastructure funding, um, moratoriums on water shutoffs during the pandemic, which Krista has already mentioned, among many other issues. So we're grateful to the Advocacy Committee. It's It really has the benefit of um, LMR board members who have literally decades of experience um, advocating in this area. And we're so grateful to have them not only on the board, but providing uh, their experience and institutional knowledge um, to newer members. And so, so thanks so much to all of our committee members and thanks to all of you for attending. And now I have the privilege to introduce Sarah Shirk. And Sarah has um, come up with a wonderful idea to raise money for the Lake Michigan uh, Region ILO. And I'm going to turn it over to her to share that exciting information with you. Thank you, Joy. I, I am the chair of our fundraising committee, so I am here to share with you our fundraising plan. I'm going to uh, direct you to, well, first, there are two, two ways to help with this year's auction. Normally, we do our auction in person, but we are using an online platform for the first time, and I see a lot of donors out there in the squares. Thank you all to have all all of you who have already donated I, donated, I want to thank you. We're going to acknowledge you at the end. Um, and for those of you who can stay, you're going to get a little sneak peek of the auction. It's going to go live in November. Um, let me take a moment to share my screen so you can see some of the opportunities to help support our fundraising effort which in turn supports the advocacy that you've all been hearing about today. So I will share my screen so that you all can see what will be available once we go live in November. This is, uh, as I said, a sneak peek. There are two ways you can help <clears throat> if you, um, uh, would like to make a donation, I just threw it into the chat. There's a form that you fill out if you'd like to uh, make a donation. We're going to run this auction for two weeks and announce the bidders at the close of our annual meeting, which will be on November 14th. And I hope many of you can attend. And just for fun, I'm gonna go through these slides quickly. I only have 10 minutes, but um, if you can help us when we send out the invitation to participate in the auction, if you can share it with your local leagues, that would really help us bring in a bigger audience. So uh, I bet there are a lot of fans of Greta Thunberg out there. We've got a book uh, package, both a book for the younger audience, the one on the left, who is Greta Thunberg, for a teenage audience, as well as uh, for an adult uh, audience, the, the New York Times bestseller of her book, No One Is Too Small To Make A Difference. And I think we all know that here at the League We've got some handmade one-of-a-kind gifts. Uh, these are handmade towels from Ruth Caputo and handmade one-of-a-kind Lake Michigan mugs, perfect for sipping <laughs> while watching the beautiful lake from your favorite spot. Uh, this is a necklace that is, I'm sure many of you recognize, the lake, those are the Great Lakes, uh, and it is a, uh, necklace that we have used for fundraisers. A lot of board members already have one and they're, it's fun to wear. It's a great icebreaker. You, you, people kind of lean in and you can tell them all about the great things that the League of Women and Voters Lake Michigan region is doing once they figure out what that necklace is. This is a print that, um, it's a five by seven print unframed that will be uh, again, showing the beautiful lake, that's uh, the artist, I'm looking at my notes here, the artist is Sharon Wade and that is her favorite view of Lake Michigan. We've got some jewelry. This jewelry is from, for those of you who are 
from the, let me get this right. Give me a moment. My papers here say this is from the Beach Bum Jewels, which is based in Michigan City, Indiana. We've got a $50 gift certificate uh, for that organization. For those of you who are Vera Bradley fans, we've got this wonderful travel pack of Vera Bra Bradley um, items, including um, a suitcase, a tablet sleeve, a cosmetic bag with mirror, and some other items. This would retail for $362, and uh, you can get it at but the bargain with our auction that's the fun part about auctions is you often get things for less than the retail price save the dunes has donated a family membership along with some t-shirts to promote their organization that's another uh, nonprofit that we collaborate with whenever we can we have a lot of members who also are active with them we also have uh five copies of the shifting sands dvd and i actually want to plug this dvd with uh, just a little bit more information about what they're all about. It says along the, shore, along the south shore of Lake Michigan at the crossroads of America, a globally rare environment collided with the industrial giants that built our nation. This coalition, this collision, excuse me, over a century old gave rise to some of the most influential environmental conflicts of the 20th century and became a microcosm for one of the most pressing issues of our time, sustainability. How do we maintain our way of life without destroying the natural world on which we all depend? And this was a uh, documentary that was shown on PBS and we've got five copies of that DVD which you can use for your own education at your, your local leagues back home. We also have a one of a kind glass piece. This was um, donated by an artist who works with the Art and Science Works in Michigan City, Indiana. And some of you may know Vita Kluko, uh, and that again is a one of a kind opportunity. So I'm gonna stop my share now and just encourage people, we're, we're gonna go live, we're, we're getting the platform. My job is to get the platform ready by November 1st for online bidding. Um, and uh, if you'd like to make a donation, I'll be taking those through November 1st. So um, those are the two ways you can help. Either make a donation or once we go live, um, bid on some great items. I hope I, hope I have uh, whetted your appetite for some of the wonderful donations we've had. And I want to uh, acknowledge the people who, who stepped up with a, a donation to help us get this launched. And those people, many of them are here today. Rosemary Heilman, Cheryl Chapman, Luann Burton, Myra Jeski, uh, Pat Wisniewski, Ruth Caputo, Anonymous, that wonderful person Anonymous has given a, a couple items, and uh, Dahlia Gigas, who is also on the call today. Thank you all for uh, contributing to our fundraising efforts. We are a lean, mean uh, organization and we will put any uh, proceeds from this auction to good use for our advocacy programs. Thank you. And if you have questions you can, about the auction, you can throw them in the chat and I'll try to uh, address them throughout the day today. All right. Well, Cheryl, it looks like we, we, we were very good. We didn't go on and on and talk too much. So we had planned for a 10 minute break, which is basically a biology break. But now it looks like we have about a half hour break, so you could actually have a bite of lunch. Uh, Krista, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we adjourn until our program begins at 1130? Uh, did you have anything else you wanted that we shortchanged you on your time, maybe? No. Um, thank you for the opportunity. But no, I just, you know, thanks to Sarah, I thought. I am certainly looking forward to bidding on those items and they look great. Thanks to everyone who donated. Um, but no, there's nothing else that I wanna share, Rosemary, thank you. All right, terrific. All right, so let's take our lunch break for half an hour and we'll reconvene. Well, I'm gonna keep this on, of course, um, at, 11, at 11.30, so sign on anytime before then. In fact, if you since it'll be open, um, if you wanna sign, sign back in and chat with each other in the chat box, that gives you a chance to uh, chat with each other and uh, ask questions or whatever. I'm gonna go for a little while, I'll be back. So uh, 
We'll enjoy the half hours. See you in a little bit. I, for uh, people who just joined in the from the waiting room, I just admitted a couple of you. We just finished our morning session and we're taking a half hour lunch break and we will reconvene at 11.30. So we'll see you there. So go grab a bite of lunch and have your biology break. And we'll look forward to hearing from, um, uh, from Ashley Williams and Latanya. Troutman uh, at 11.30. You can use the chat box to talk with people if you wish in the meantime.
pause. All right, it's 11.30 and we are back from our break. I'm gonna stop the share. And Cheryl, do we have, is a Faye, let me see if Faye Moore is back in the, um, and if I still, there she is. And I'm gonna make her a co-host again. And Cheryl, would you like to introduce Faye, who's going to sure. speak? Yes. Yeah, Hi, go. Faye. Oh, good. Faye's unmuted. Hi. So everywhere I go in town, whether it's the Head Start program or environmental things or women's things, I see Faye there. So she seemed the most wonderful person to introduce our two upcoming speakers. So Faye, I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you again for attending today and for agreeing to be a part of this. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and I really appreciate the uh, program today. It's been awesome, hasn't it been people? It's been beautiful. Um, our speakers have been just so wonderful. So um, I have the privilege of introducing two more wonderful presenters. Uh, Miss Latanya Trotman, known as Michigan City's Merry Christmas, and <laughs> Miss Ashley Williams. Um, they are superb community organizers and environmentalists, and their work in Northwest Indiana is an excellent example of successful networking for the common good. Latanya Trotman is the Environmental Climate Justice Chair of the LaPorte County mm -hmm. NAACP and a founding member of Just Transition Northwest Indiana. And Ashley is an organizer with the Sierra Club and also a founding member of <clears throat> Just Transition Northwest Indiana. Both are residents of Michigan City. And you can read more about their background um, in the uh, Chicago Tribune article on the league's website. They're their grassroots organization, Just Transition in Northwest Indiana is committed to bringing about change in our economy in Northwest Indiana for that has impacted our communities and the workers in our communities. They are working with the local branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and community members and organizations from across the region. Just Transition Northwest Indiana has represented ordinary citizens in moving Northern Indiana Public Service Company, NIPSCO, to revamp their plans for the local coal removal. We can learn more about their efforts, um, again, on our website, the League of Women Voters website. And um, they are gonna highlight some of the things that they're doing this um, today. Um, and as a reminder, you can put your um, questions in the chat box for um, Merry Christmas and um, Ashley Williams. I give you Merry Christmas and Ashley Williams. Thank you, Faye. You're welcome. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you so much, Faye. Thank you um, to the women of the League of Women Voters for having us today. This has been an awesome awesome conference and um, we really appreciate the invite and um, are glad to be here. So as Faye just said, um, everyone knows me as Merry Christmas, but my name is Latanya Troutman um, and I am one of the founding members of Just Transition NWI as well as the Environmental Climate Justice Chair for the LaPorte County Branch NAACP. Um, and I am also a um, public relations specialist with my own business um, called Perfect PR. Um, and that is going to be important as you will see throughout our presentation um, when we talk about our skills and talents and things that we bring to the table. Um, and why I got started in, 
in this work is simply because um, <laughs> Michigan City is good ground. Uh, unfortunately, um, sometimes when we leave it abandoned, um, we don't get the good fruit from it. And so because we're here, we're on good ground and I am um, a good person on this good ground, I would like to see some change come into our communities because there are um, approximately 31,000 people in Michigan City who also are on good ground um, and can do good things. And we wanna see that um, take place in a resilient community of Michigan City. So um, tired of the status quo, I am here for um, as an agent of change. And with that being said, I'm going to pass this on to my um, partner in crime. Um, we get in a lot of good trouble together. Um, as plenty of you may know, Ashley Williams. Thank you so much, Nikki. Hi, y'all. Um, Ashley Williams again. My pronouns are she, her, and I reside here in Michigan City as well. Um, a little bit of background about me. I wear my Just Transition NWI hat here in Michigan City, so I'm, I'm a member and co-founder, as was discussed, and, um, and I'm also an organizer within Sierra Club within the Beyond Gold to Clean Energy campaign, and so I'm predominantly organized in Greater Lafayette. I'm not sure if Liz Solberg is on the call, but she is part of our team. Shout out to Liz. Um, we love her and uh, we're doing a lot of great work there uh, actually around uh, Duke Energy and trying to transition them. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm actually a transplant. I'm not originally from Michigan City. Uh, I'm originally from Ottawa, Illinois. Uh, so lived in Illinois all my life up until moving to Chicago where I pursued my education and really cut my teeth, um, what we call in the organizing world um, on the Southeast side uh, where I organize with an amazing coalition called the Southeast uh, Side Coalition to ban pet coke. And um, they're on Facebook, please look them up and support them. Uh, we organized against the injustice of petroleum coke there um, and found myself here in Michigan City through Sierra Club and really you know what it comes down to is I believe that our community should not be treated as sacrifice zones right they shouldn't be sacrificed for heavy um, industrial polluters um, that our community should be able to be made whole again right and so that's really what we're going to be talking about here so I'm you know really in this work because I believe we should come together around that, right, and stopping sacrifice zones um, and really pursuing our collective liberation, right, from these industries that are really holding us hostage, industries like NIPSCO that we will talk about in depth here in a second, um, and so on. But that's a little bit about me. And um, just for an overview of what we'll be discussing, I'm going to go more into uh, a general overview about just transition and what we mean when we talk about that, right? What does it look like in terms of the roots and those origins, and how has it been used over time? Then we'll go a little bit more into who we are as Just Transition NWI or Northwest Indiana. And Nikki will unpack that a little bit more. And then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what our work has been uh, around the coal ash uh, here in, in Michigan City as Indra talked about so eloquently earlier and then giving y'all some opportunities for how you can engage with us in the future. Um, with that, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And this is really important to keep in mind as we continue through this presentation. And I'm just gonna leave you with this. Transition is inevitable, justice is not. So bear this in mind as we continue on with the presentation. <clears throat> so when we're thinking presently about our economy, our economy is predominantly a dig, burn, dump economy, right? So one that's predicated on the mass accumulation of wealth where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Right, so this is an injustice, right? There is mass inequity within our system, right? Our very racist <laughs> design to fail system that, that we live in today, uh, right? This is done through the exploitation of human labor, right? And this is, you know, really we see this in different facets, rather it be our military industrial complex through our governance and the administration that we're currently in right now, right? Um, and thinking about within the energy sector that we'll be talking about in length, we see, right, these systems of racism and exploitation. And, right, this is the economy that we don't wanna live in, right? We really wanna think about what we can do to reimagine, right, and organize for a just system, right? And really flipping this on its head. 
Um, and so unfortunately, right, within this extractive economy, our communities have been sacrificed uh, by the fossil fuel industry, by coal plants. And so when we talk about just transition, this isn't specifically just about our energy sector, right? It's really talking about holistically, how do we really change, frankly, the whole thing, right? And as I mentioned in the beginning, making our communities and workers whole, right? So really keeping that in mind. So what we talk about is sort of, right, stopping the bad, right, stopping the injustice and building the new. And that is everything to do with a, a just transition, right? So a just transition means that we must transition from an extractive economy, right, that you see here on the left-hand side to one that is rooted in regeneration and resilience. So this means, as I mentioned, not just through energy, but also through other uh, facets of production, right? So it, whether it be housing or transit, labor relations, uh, governance, just to make name a few, so thinking about through our resources, rather than depleting that we're replenishing them, right? <laughs> we're keeping the oil, we're keeping it in the ground, we're keeping these resources and really again, pulling from right our sun and our wind and, and all these different forces, right? That are renewable and replenishable and that we'll have for generations to come. Thinking about energy democracy, right? And so rather than just being able to bring in some wind from a neighboring, from Iowa or from a neighboring community, really thinking about how do we build, right, these systems in our community, right? So we see the benefits of this and the transition within our own eyes. And then also, right, it doesn't mean anything unless the community is part of this process. So at the center that you'll see of this regenerative economy, right, is cooperation, right? And so us all coming together to make this so, Right, because it doesn't mean anything unless the community is at the table. And so often what we see within this within this extractive economy that they're not right, they're left out, they're left behind, the workers, the communities, everyone is left behind. And so this is a really amazing graphic and y'all can see this anytime it's uh, through Climate Justice Alliance and uh, an organization I really love and follow. And they've really been a leader within the national move for just transition within the country. Uh, another quote I wanted to bring into, this is actually a quote from us uh, and part of our sort of story of just transition. A just transition will propel us forward from an economy based in extraction to one based in resilience, while redressing and healing environmental injustices and harms disproportionately endured by poor and working class communities and communities of color. That has everything to do with who we are and why we're doing this work, right? Um, and Nikki's gonna talk more about specifically the Michigan City community and, and how does that all factor in. And really, again, Michigan City has been our hub, our roots, where we've, we've really um, created our work. And so we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little while. I do wanna go into as, as a framing, uh, before we go into more about Just Transition, what are the roots of Just Transition? So it really all began uh, with this with this man among many uh, named Tony Mizaki and Tony Mizaki was a leader in the oil chemical and atomic workers union. He was a fierce leader. Um, he was actually cre uh, credited credited by then President Nixon as being the primary force behind the enactment of OSHA and that's the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. He was the mentor of Karen Silkwood, as I'm sure many of you know. She was a union activist in Oklahoma, um, all around Hellraiser and a co-founder of the Labor Party. Uh, also, when you think about Tony uh, Mizaki, he was called the Rachel Carson of the American workplace. And so this term was really coined by him in thinking about if there was a super fund for dirt, there ought to be one for the workers, right? And so it when you talk about just transition, the origins, people think about uh, this phrase and also the fact that there, you know, there should be this sort of um, GI bill, right, for, for the workers, if you will, right, within, within this transition process. And so that's really a, a quote that's highly regarded and quoted um, all over. Um, and so it, it makes perfect sense, right, but you know, there just there wasn't there really wasn't until uh, Tony and other labor unions really started to uh, coin this and craft this and operationalize it. So as was mentioned, um, this really started to take off in the 1990s, but it has developed a much deeper meaning, right? So as as an old white guy, um, 
Tony, Tony really spoke for, for the laborers and the workers within right, the halls of these extractive industries. But here in today, uh, it has taken on, as mentioned, a much deeper meaning. So whether it be the fight and the struggle for indigenous sovereignty that we'll talk about here in a second, across the anti-war and environmental justice movements, as well as the uh, youth climate movements, right? So we talked about Greta earlier and others. And so it really has taken on a much deeper meaning. It's, it's not just right a matter of not leaving the workers behind, but not leaving these communities behind. And knowing that, again, who uh, when it comes down to sacrifice, right, it is always low income communities of color, right, that are first and foremost. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go in a little bit more uh, to talk about uh, indigenous sovereignty. So with that, uh, this is actually a graphic from the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is another amazing organization that I recommend y'all check out, um, who really are leaders in this, in this concept of just transition. And for Indigenous leaders, they really adhere to the principles of just transition, which are threefold. Responsibility and relationship, so transformation of our relationship with Mother Earth, as you see really clearly illustrated right here. Secondly, I talked about sovereignty. So thinking about, right, we're just on the heels of Indigenous Peoples Day, right? Uh, thinking about land back, right, and reclaiming what was stolen, right, through the raping and pillaging and genocide of the Indigenous people and the earth. Um, and then lastly, transformation action, uh, thinking about meaningful and localized community building yeah. jobs. Native, um, thinking about Native and, um, oops, sorry, Native justice and energy democracy and community-based healthcare, uh, just to name a few. I'm just gonna pause here and I'm gonna play a video, but I actually need to plug in my charger. So give me just one second here. You know, while, while you're doing that, Ashley, everybody, I just got this weird message on my computer that my battery is running low, even though I'm charged up to 70%. So let's hope this holds out till the end of the talk. If it doesn't, I'm not quite sure what we'll do, but um, just a warning, maybe Deb Chubb, could you prepare to take over maybe? I'm gonna make Deb a co-host and um, she has, maybe she has a uh, Zoom account that, that can take it over. Uh, so thank you, I'm sorry for the interruption. I hope it doesn't come to that. I did the same thing and I'm plugged in. I think it's the actual battery battery, you know, not the, yeah. Hmm. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. Just Oh, no worries. That gave me time. I also <laughs> was, was uh, running low on juice, so I wanted to make sure uh, that didn't happen. So I'm actually going to play a video. I'm hoping it, everyone is going to be able to hear it okay. I'm going to play a video um, about just transition that um, comes from, so it's uh, Germany. So it's a, it's a community in from Tonawanda, New York that travels to Germany to see what they've done around just transition. And um, it's a really interesting example. And this community we'll talk about more in a second has endured uh, a retirement of a coal plant locally. And so they, they visited Germany to see what other communities have done, what's possible. So this is just a really short video just to give you a little bit more of a taste of what's happened and what that's looked like um, in this case internationally. So hopefully this plays. We are visiting right now a redevelopment of one of the largest coal mines in uh, the western part of Germany. We're in Dortmund. They have created a lake from an old industrial site as a transition project. Oh, I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Pretend that didn't happen. Here you go. We are visiting right now a redevelopment of one of the largest coal mines in uh, the western part of Germany. We're in Dortmund. They have created a lake from an old industrial site as a transition project. In Germany and the United States, coal still plays an important role as an energy source. Nevertheless, the sector is employing fewer and fewer people. 
Why? Mining coal releases heavy metals, which is harmful for people and the environment. Burning coal also produces huge amounts of greenhouse gases that speed climate change. Coal plants are also shutting down because of market factors that give an edge to more profitable energy sources like natural gas and renewables. Even though many people in Kentucky don't necessarily agree on things like climate change, the world is moving in a certain direction. We have to respond to that in a way that doesn't leave the people behind that are most directly affected. Coal helped power the Industrial Revolution and the transformation of our economies. This heritage is a source of pride for many communities, and the transition away from coal is no easy task. We've heard from people here that there is life after coal. These are people who are very, very proud of their coal heritage, which is very similar uh, to what we see back home in Central Appalachia. Some former coal regions have already started to reinvent themselves. In Essen, Germany, an old mine was transformed into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In neighboring Dortmund, a former steel plant site was converted into a nanotechnology hub and recreation area. A family-owned company in Bochum went from producing gearboxes for mines to producing gearboxes for wind turbines. Throughout Germany and the rest of the European Union, jobs in renewables already outnumber those in coal. The thing that struck me most is that the amount of investment that the German government, in a variety of ways, has put into these communities. They're using their heritage and their history as an asset to uh, build culture in a place so that they can remember where they've come from, but also look forward to building the community that they want to see in the future. In a challenging situation where we're facing real risk, um, we can do two things. We can decide not to fight it, we can decide not to come together, we can decide not to accept and adapt, or we can we can work on it, you know, jointly. And, and I see a just transition as the way to do just that. These cities have shown that life after coal is possible. With this just transition, we can create good jobs and a sustainable future for our communities. All right, so uh, hopefully, hopefully you all enjoyed the video. Please uh, feel free to drop in more reflections in the chat and we'll, we'll talk more about that in the Q&A. And was excited to see a lot of familiar faces in that video. Uh, uh, we, there was Cindy Winland who was with the Delta Institute at the time that you saw featured in there. My good friend, Rebecca Newberry uh, from Tonawanda, New York was also in there. And we'll be talking about a specific example uh, with Tonawanda uh, just right now. So uh, feel free to continue to reflect on that. And um, that's like, I'll, I'll make sure that we have this presentation uh, for League of Women Voters and they can circulate it as well. So you can check out the different links uh, within your own time. With talking about this video example, I wanted to go in a little bit deeper on Tonawanda. So that was uh, some of the community that was there in the video uh, was from Tonawanda, New York. And just a little bit of background uh, with anticipating the retirement of the Huntley generating station in Tonawanda, New York, and that was 760 megawatts. The Huntley Alliance formed, uh, which was comprised of workers and community members and primarily supported by the Clean Air Coalition of Western New York. So I mentioned my friend Rebecca Newberry, she's their director there. And they organized to pass a now $45 million gap fund in the New York Assembly for all communities facing a fossil fuel retirement. And so basically with gap funding, they were able to get it through a budget bill and it, it's basically emergency money, right? So communities that are facing this, understanding that their tax base is gonna be wholly affected, understanding that with workers, right, that may have no place to turn, um, there is emergency money that is there and available to help resuscitate these communities, right? And so um, there's an important quote that I put here on the screen as well um, from a person that was uh, part of this whole process, uh, David Schlissel. And he mentions, uh, instead of spending millions on propping up coal plants, right, which we do very well in the state of Indiana, um, we need to spend money to help communities make an economic transition, right? And so that's 
everything uh, that has to do with just transition. And so with the Huntley Alliance, really when we're thinking about kind of the time horizon, they formed in 2013. Uh, and this was before they officially got the coal plant retirement. So they were anticipating this announcement. As, as I mentioned in the beginning, right? Think about, right? Transition is inevitable, justice is not, right? We know these coal plants and these, these gas plants are gonna be retiring. It's just a matter of when and whether or not the community and workers and all those impacted are gonna be at the table at the forefront of this process. So they formed uh, through a number of different unions. Uh, they had the teachers a union, the steel workers, the IBW or the International Electrical uh, Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, as well as the Co uh, Clean Air Coalition, as I mentioned before. The Sierra Club is also a part of it. And they began to have many meetings in 2013 and really began to build out a robust campaign around this. So talking about what are their demands, right? And so they came to the table and talking about, we wanna maintain fair funding for our schools. We wanna create good paying jobs with benefits and protections for uh, workers as well as ratepayers. We know typically when these coal plants are coming offline, we do incur the cost. So whether it be the coal ash cleanup uh, that we'll talk about more later on, uh, whether it be um, the change in generation, we as ratepayers tend to incur those costs. Um, and then thinking about within the organizing campaign, they also talked about how they could better reconnect with the waterfront, right? Sounds familiar, like here in Michigan City, understanding where the placement of the Michigan City Generating Station is right there on our Lake Michigan Lake front. And then building and sustaining a new tax base, right? Understanding this plan is coming offline. What is that new tax base going to be? Many of these communities that have the coal plants are mono economies, right? So they're wholly dependent on these fossil fuel facilities, right? What happens, right, when they come offline? Um, that's very important to be thinking about. The plant retired in 2016, and they went through a whole different visioning, they went through a whole visioning session and anticipation after this plant retirement, uh, really being able to figure out what does that look like to carry forth these demands. So they went and, and um, collaborated with the Delta Institute um, just transition fund with these listening and visioning sessions, um, talking about right the, uh, how we can um, offset the tax base loss and all these different things. And right now, um, there's still uh, there's still a process that's in place for the plan itself. Uh, the Clean Air Task Force has actually changed gears um, through this process, and actually, and something I would like to talk about, um, and, and being able to stand up for Tesla workers. So there's a gigafactory there. Um, it's actually in Buffalo, New York. And Tesla workers are being um, exposed to inhumane treatment. Um, it's been very, very bad there. Uh, lots of reports of discrimination and racism in the workplace. And so uh, this group is actually working with them to unionize and fight these unfair conditions. So um, understanding, right, uh, when we talk about renewables, right, Tesla is there, you know, held up um, on this sort of, right, um, high altar. But Tesla, there's a lot of things that happen within the workplace, a lot of grotesque conditions. Um, we also know with the mining of rare earth minerals um, that go into this process. So we have to really think about, again, holistically, uh, we're not just talking about renewables as the solutions. It has to be done with justice at every end, right? So just a little bit of a spotlight there. And then um, talking about another example of just transition is important to talk about the Colorado Just Transition Act. So this was passed the other year and um, this really created a blueprint for Colorado. So it's total, it's called the Just Transition from Coal-Based Electrical Energy Economy um, Act and that's 1314, House Bill 1414. It was signed into law on May 28th of 2019, and it serves as the first state to think about just transition on a statewide basis. Uh, and the state itself is, is committed to trying to go fossil fuel free by 2040. Um, and so that's something that they've laid out. Uh, we, through our, our organizing work, have actually had conversations with um, the director, Wayne Buchanan, of uh, the Colorado Just Transition Office that was created through this act and um, talk to him about kind of the origins and how this came about. There are three goals within the act. Uh, they creates benefits for former coal workers, um, including education and training leading to high quality jobs, strategizing to assist communities dealing with the closure of mines, coal plants and other factors, and then finding and creating grant and other funding opportunities to, to assist. 
<clears throat> so this was done through bipartisan legislation. Um, the transition itself is more narrowly defined. It's really thinking about, again, accepting that inevitability of the coal plants and the mines coming offline and really focusing on what is that, that new economy, that diverse, uh, resilient economy. It was largely backed by labor, which was important. And um, they, they pushed for many things, including uh, wage differentials within this. And the difference, right, between uh, us in Colorado are, are, are many and too many to, to say here, but um, they have really, again, accepted uh, the transition um, and decommissioning of these plants as that inevitability. And Indiana is not to that point yet, as we know. Um, we're kind of at this last stand with, with coal here. Um, and so that's something that we're not, what we're talking about and we'll be talking about um, with Nikki's part of the presentation about what we're trying to do to change that and change the narrative. Um, and so this is, this is something I, I definitely in, um, encourage folks to check, take a look at. It's a really important act. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great blueprint of what is happening around this, but also thinking about uh, more holistically. So the Just Transition Act doesn't specifically talk about necessarily um, gas plants or other fossil fuel infrastructure. I think that's also really important. Um, and, and thinking about uh, how through this Just Transition Act, they're making these recommendations really happen. Um, so they're still in the phases of that and they're um, anticipating delivering recommendations on this to the governor uh, December of this year. Uh, and just a few more slides before we pass it on to Nikki. Um, in terms of why, so <laughs> given all that I, I just talked about, why, why just transition? Why Northwest Indiana, right? And so just take a look. This is a snapshot of all these different, I mean, just a few articles uh, that have come out in the, the past few years around um, these, these different facilities within Northwest Indiana, and just not, not just NIPSCO, but others, as you can see. At a glance, it is astounding, right? What has happened? This is not just environmental pollution, but also the mass layoffs, um, all these different things, the, the potential for gentrification uh, within, within Michigan City. So at a glance, right, it is astounding the necessity for why we need to talk about a transition that is just and equitable, right? So we have in 2019, right, 3,000 fish were killed um, because of ArcelorMittal and their negligence, right, on, along our shores. Uh, they actually were recently acquired by Cleveland Cliffs, uh, just as an FYI, but they violated the clean air water, their clean air water permit uh, more than 100 times in the past few years. Just, just like let that sink in. Um, and they've been caught manipulating data, right? Um, they, they've also, as you can see within this, there's been mass layoffs uh, that have happened at Arcelor. Um, there's no assurances in terms of, of what that means for the workers within inside, you know, inside the facilities uh, within Indiana Harbor. And so those are things that we need to be talking about here. Um, in terms of U.S. Steel, there was the huge hexavalent chromium spills, right, that we, we heard about as well. Um, that was really, we, we saw this happening in 2019. I mean, five plus times and more, even more than we don't know, um, that they discharged hexavalent chromium. And again, this is a carcinogen that was made infamous by Erin Brockovich, right, in her, in her fight against pg e as I'm sure many of you recall. Uh, there's the BP Whiting facility, right? This is a colossal facility that is the size of the Chicago Loop. Um, they've been routinely negligent as well. Um, all kinds of things um, that have come out of there is, is, you know, and so we really have, again, these, these huge mega corporations within, within our region, unrivaled, right, from really any other areas, maybe outside of Houston. So there is a lot at stake for our region. Um, and understanding, again, Right, transition is inevitable, justice is not. So we really have to get um, ahead of this and at the forefront. Um, as I mentioned too, there's a big concern around gentrification and what is gonna happen in Michigan City. Uh, this article is very troubling where it says, will Michigan City become the next New Buffalo? <laughs> no, we don't want it to be New Buffalo, right? We want it to be Michigan City. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really concerning when we, we see that language as well, where uh, potentially, right, communities here on the west side may be displaced in this process if they want to you know come in and put who knows what um, in place of the coal plant um, 
but these are real things that we have to talk about. And so um, I wanted to make sure that, that folks were able to see this through the presentation. Um, a few more things, fast facts. This is uh, from the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission's report that came out in 2019 uh, about NIPSCO and other facilities that are coming offline in the coming years and decommissioning. Uh, over the next dec decade, uh, 7,730 megawatts of coal are due to be retired, bringing the total of to 11,444 megawatts since uh, 2010. Our utility NIPSCO contributes to approximately one fourth of these retirements. So that's, I mean, that's a that's a huge that's a huge total. Um, NIPSCO is is making up a very large quantity of that. And uh, when we send out this presentation, you can check out the very lengthy uh, report about this, where it goes into depth about uh, what we're facing with the forthcoming decommissioning of NIPSCO's plants and others. Another fast fact is regarding. Uh, local losses as well as with jobs. Uh, 300 jobs are at risk due to the scheduled retirement of the Schaefer plant, and that's in Jasper County and Wheatfield in 2023. 120 jobs estimated are at risk in Michigan City due to the forthcoming retirement in 2028. Uh, 7.5 million in annual state and local losses are expected as a result of the Schaefer retirement, and 3.6 million for Michigan City. Uh, this is also from that report um, in terms of the impacts of what the decommissionings will have on our Michigan city as well as the Wheatfield communities. Uh, with that, I'm going to conclude the overview section of the presentation and I pass it along to Nikki, <laughs> aka Merry Christmas, to talk more specifically about what we've been able to do to address just transition here in Northwest Indiana. <coughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Merry Christmas again, everybody. Um, if you are on the line right now and you are in this picture or know someone in this picture, I want you to say, I am creating a just transition in NWI. If you are in this picture right now, if you are not and you would like to be in the next picture, say, I want to help create a just transition in NWI in the chat right now um and i don't see the chat moving so i won't be moving until you guys swallow suit because i like engagement because engagement as we will see is what creates change um within this movement being a part of the process at the the grassroots level the people power and using your voices is how we're going to create change um just sitting by idly will keep things the same as we've seen for decades um, with Ashley's presentation, as well as with Dr. Indra's presentation and kind of throughout the day, you know, we've seen things stay the same. So um, we know, I, I know that the League of Women Voters are women who want to create change. So as agents of change, I wanna see this chat just chiming on with Merry Christmases and people who want to be a part of this here um, movement and creating a just transition. So with that being said, this group of lovely people that just passed in the previous slide um, is um, a part of our grassroots organization um, within the Northwest Indiana region that is comprised of partners, organizations, and um, including the PDA, Progressive Democrats of America, the NAACP, as well as Green Drinks. Shout out to Nancy, who's um, here today, um, and other individual members, as, as well as partnering organizations. Um, together, we create a Just Transition NWI, where our vision is an empowered NWI, where people live in clean, healthy, and united communities. Um, our mission is to educate and organize Northwest Indiana communities and workers to give voice to their stories and to support a just transition to a regenerative economy that protects our environment, climate, and our future generations. Um, our values include inclusivity, solidarity, and justice for all. Um, when you talk about being inclusive, a lot of times um, people think if you know you have a group that everybody's included. Well, it's not just enough to have a group, but it's important to have a diverse group. And then that is um, interconnected, that brings about that solidarity. So it's not just one set of stakeholders, one set of stakeholders, but everybody who is impacted. That is very, very important, especially when you see um, 
injustices such as the environmental injustice that we've heard so much about um, through Ashley's presentation and in the presentations before us. Um, so next slide, Ashley. Um, we also, um, within our group, um, we do have goals. Um, and so some of our goals just really quickly are within our short-term goals, we wanna be able to urge NIPSCO and IDEM to um, implement a safe closure of the Michigan City coal ash ponds and the ponds, other ponds in the Northwest Indiana region, including the Bailey and Schaefer ones. Um, over time, we wanna be able to launch a public participation process for the Michigan City area and ensure that the city acquires the um, site and ownership of the property is transferred to the public. Um, and in the very long term run, we want to be able to bring NIPSCO as a utility under public ownership. In order to do that, um, again, we need people power. So just using this quote from Gene Sharp, who is a political scientist who coined the theory of power, um, he stated that power ultimately rests not in the grip of presidents, generals, and billionaires, but in the hands of millions of ordinary people who keep society running smoothly on a day-to-day -day basis and who can shut it down should they choose. And based on what I saw in the chat, either you have already chosen or you just made the decision to be a part of those ordinary people who can, you know, overthrow things that just aren't working for us anymore. And we know that as, as Ashley pointed out that the extractive economy that we've been living in no longer works for us. And so we wanna be able to change and, and move forward to a new. Um, so with that, um, we understand that people believe that this is a, um, you know, a top down sort of thing, but we believe truly in bottom up you know, organizing to make things happen. And so if you look here, you will see some of our organizing timeline. Um, and we used our bottom-up strategy to create um, several successes along the way. So um, during, you know, the fall of 2017 um, into 2018, we kind of got our start as Beyond Cold, the Beyond Cold campaign um, launches in 2017 and forms a collaboration with the NAACP um, based on some of the information that you will see later. Um, and we had formed around NIPSCO's announcement of their retirement. When they announced their retirement, we were there saying they would um, retire the Schaefer plant by 2023 and the Michigan City plant by 2028. We were there to say, that's great, but not good enough. We were there for the beginning of that fight. Um, and we they wanted to do this as a part of their 20 year plan. We know that they can do better and we wanna make sure that when they if, when and if they announce to do at a sooner time that we are prepared as a community, as a people, as workers, and as the environment. Um, and then in going into um, 2019 from that, stemming from that, we organized around the um, industrial cost shift that NIPSCO was proposing onto its um, customers like us, you know, that was come from giving their um, industrial customers a, a big cost break um, by 19%. Well, we were able to drop that significantly because we were there with our grassroots organization, organizing and being able to engage the community and being able to bring people out in numbers. That gave us a great victory to be able to cut that cost shift um, at least by half. Um, and then we continue to organize. Um, basically, um, you know, from this cost shift into forming a new organization, because we know, and you guys should know too, as League of Women Voters, sometimes the um, organizations such as the NAACP, such as the Sierra Club, we're considered the usual suspects. And so um, when we're considered the usual suspects, we all know that there may be a little bit of hesitancy, you know, to uh, be a part of our organizations. And so with that, we wanted to kind of be able to take the caps off and form something new where people can identify with just what this is and this being something new, something for the people and something that was fresh and that will be resilient. And so that's kind of how um, Just Transition was starting to um, form as its embryo <laughs> stages um, and went about. And through that, we kind of come together, created our visions, values, our goals and things like that. And we were able to launch um, so, um, it was abrupt um, through NIPSCO's coal ash closure plan and with 
with the Michigan City and transferring that um, over to the Shaver process. And we were able to receive um, some great um, successes with that as well. Um, so, you know, using our people power, we were able to actually um, organize and be able to create create small victories, you know, over the course of this um, two and a half year span. Um, and it has been a really, really great work for us. But I will tell you, if you put in that chat box that you want in, we do need your help because the fight is on. You know what I mean? We are we are in a time where we're, um, as you guys know, being the League of Women Voters, that this election matters um, more than ever. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you stand on. It's a matter of what are you standing for? You know what I mean? And so making sure we can stand as a Democratic person, we can stand as a Republican person, but why are you standing you know, there? What are you standing there for? We should be able to come together as um, regardless to whatever party, but be able to talk about the issues and be able to come together um, and build a better and more resilient United States of America. So this election is pivotal. Um, and with that, I wanna be able to go to the next slide, Ashley. Um, so um, just, you know, a little bit more about Michigan City. As we see here, this is the Michigan City Generating Station, um, which um, Dr. Andrew talked about earlier today. Um, and if you know about Michigan City, Michigan City is comprised, as I said before, about 31,000 um, individuals. Um, and it's fairly small, but, you know, we're in a community where everybody kind of knows everybody. Um, and the west side is where the um, NIPSCO plant is currently sitting. And Michigan City has about, um, based on the Alice reports that was taken, 51% or 53% of the residents are struggling to meet their basic needs. 45% of those um, that are struggling to meet their basic needs are, um, or excuse me, 25% of those that are struggling are in poverty. And of the 25, 45% of those are African-American, which those are the people that are predominantly living on the west side of um, the Michigan City nearest this coal plant. And so when you look at um, this chart here, you see the health impacts. And so when you look at per year, you have um, 21 deaths per year, six hospital admissions per year, nine asthma, or, ER visits per year, um, 13 heart attacks, you know, five um, bronchitis attacks, 100, um, or excuse me, 994 work loss days. And those things make uh, uh, um, our communities really, really struggle. And when you see things like COVID-19, which has also come in and really um, took a toll on the African-American community, and then you couple that with the things that you see that are impacting the communities with this coal plant, um, it is a really, really heavy blow to um, the low-income community as well as the African-American community. So again, as I stated before on the previous slide, that we received um, that the um, our organizing started because of um, this, they, them receiving this failing grade from the um, cold blooded report, which is based on a toxic impact of the low income communities and um, communities of color. So, you know, just looking at this and coupling this with Dr. Endra's previous information on how we're being impacted. A lot of times when you think about deaths, when you think about things like bronchitis and when you think about the impacts of food, you know, the food deserts and all of these and how it really couples together, unfortunately, we are not able to tie in the um, how we're really being impacted by the coal plant being in our backyards. Next slide, Ashley. Okay, and so then when um, when we are talking about Jasper County, now Jasper County is also a smaller um, county, and but it's comprised of low income community, of you know, predominantly white. However, uh oh, um, it is still a low income community, and they were hit very very hard. We actually did some organizing and some work with them, and you know, hit by cancer, their drinking water, like um, issues that we've seen with our neighbors in the town of Pines. Um, and if you look at the health impacts, that they have um, 23 deaths per year. Um, so they're a little higher rate, being that they have um, a little, they're a little closer to um, their coal plants. Um, and it is unfortunate how, they, and they have, I believe they have two or they had two, if I'm not mistaken, Ashley, was that correct, two or three? 
The coal plants? The coal plants? Yes. Yeah, just one, Schaefer. Nikki, you're on mute. Okay, so um, just looking at that again, you see, um, again, the number of heart attacks, the number of hospital admin, uh, admissions, and when you think about the health risk and you think about how the communities are already struggling to meet their basic needs, it is definitely um, a problem with having these coal plants within the um, within these communities and what we need to do about them. Uh, next slide, Ashley. Okay, and so, Understanding, as I said before, that um, we really are a, a diverse group of people, we wanted to be able to not only include the workers, not only include the communities Im impacted, but include the people who um, comprise our future generations, which is these children here. Um, and if you see, um, these are some of our children from the Gary Steel Mill Academy, um, but the picture in the background is actually an acopolis that was created by um, all of the impacted communities within the Northwest Indiana region. Um, and we were able to kind of create this whole um, reimagining of the, um, the uh, coal plant company and what we would like to see. And so, if you look at, into the picture, you will see, you know, the sun, you will see kind of food and um, vital resources that we need to be resilient. Um, and if you look again, you will see a lot of youth. These, some of these youths are actually active with us today. Um, great speakers with us, and you will be amazed at the gifts and talents that are actually in this picture. So um, I encourage you all to kind of grab and get a youth because some of them are really, really amazing and really, really looking for, you know, a way to find their voice. And so I'm going to turn to Ashley considering the time. Um, yeah, uh, well, just considering the time we're going to keep moving, but this was an awesome, awesome event that really showed what we would like to see um, with this NIPSCO, um, when these NIPSCO plants retire. Next slide, Ashley. Um, here again is just some, a few more of our successes highlighting. Again, really um, important that we have youth engagement. You also see here where we did um, our rally on the west side of Michigan City down at the bottom there with um, Pat Boy, who is also on the line. Merry Christmas, Pat. Um, thank you so much for always being um, supportive. Um, but there is also city council members from Hammond and Gary in there. Um, you also see our renewable power rangers who are um, suited and booted and ready to get to it. Um, so they are really awesome. We have fought for a bill such as the House Bill 1470 about the blank check. Um, we've also stood before the IURC to um, give our testimony on what needs to happen within our communities. I mean, we've just kind of kept the ball rolling and continuously stayed moving. Next slide, Ashley. Um, here, if anybody knows the little guy in the corner right there, the, um, his name's Brandon. If you know him, can you tell me um, who he is or who he belongs to? Does anybody know him? Um, if you know, drop that in the chat. Um, we also have um, the young lady with the um, green sweater on up there. Her name is Ethel. She's a true champion. Um, she, smoke, she spoke at the um, youth climate strike here in Indiana. Awesome. Yes, that is Pat Boy's grandson. Thank you, ladies. Um, so awesome, awesome youth, um, really way to engage. We don't just stop with the youth. We like to see a full diverse, we want African-American, Hispanics, um, kids, elderly, everybody, anybody who's impacted or has a stake. So um, next slide, Ashley. Okay, um, so with that being said, this is kind of who we are. This is what makes us, um, you know, who we are as a grassroots organization. And what we do is get engaged, we stay engaged. We make sure that as you saw with um, Ashley's part, that we kind of are educating and then we are engaging because then we can bring about action. So with that, I'm gonna turn this portion over to Ashley. Hey, sorry we're over time. <laughs> Hope y'all are enjoying it. Um, so there's a lot of material um, and I'm gonna 
try to go quickly through this, but here's just a, a quick quote from uh, the Climate Justice Alliance and the reason we'll be talking about coal ash here in a second. The transition itself must be just and equitable, redressing past harms and creating new relationships of power for future, sorry, through, through the future, through reparations. So the reason that we, we're gonna be talking about coal ash is it's, it's just a part of a just transition, right? So making our communities whole, as I've been mentioning before, and making sure that when these utilities are leaving behind their mess, that it gets cleaned up, right? And making sure that um, through that process that the communities, and especially with the West Side neighborhood here in Michigan City, are taken care of, right? Um, so through the historical harms that NIPSCO and other utilities have caused to our communities, it's really about redressing that. And that's a really big, again, foundation and sort of pillar rather of a uh, just transition that we'll be talking about. So I won't go too much into the technical side and the good scientific stuff as Indra has uh, already pointed out and went into in depth, but uh, here is just a snapshot of an aerial view of the coal ash in Michigan City. Uh, as Indra mentioned, there's a lot at play here in terms of pollution. Um, all, of all of NIPSCO's plants rather, including in Michigan City, are contaminated in terms of the groundwater on site. Uh, this is likely leaching into Lake Michigan and Trail Creek, so all the contaminants. And we don't have answers <laughs> in terms of uh, from what fully that, that impact is looking like. And, and so that was that's one of our organizing demands um, is to call for monitoring third party uh, for the air as well as the water uh, within Michigan City. Um, secondly, NIPSCO does have uh, quite the footprint here in um, the Michigan City area, as was mentioned earlier about the town of Pines. Um, One million tons of coal ash dumped on the community um, over a number of years. Um, in it, actually, indeed, the town itself was really built on coal ash uh, during what we sort of call as a, a coal ash giveaway that happened um, a number of years ago, tracing back to the 1970s when the town was paved with uh, coal ash for land and road fill. Um, they also had uh, the Yard 520 site where the NIPSCO's coal ash was actually deposited uh, that it, again, ultimately accumulated and that was what ultimately caused the mass contamination of this tiny, tiny town right next to Michigan City and uh, many of which uh, residents have not come back to because of this and unfortunately as you see on the screen there are still a number of residents that do not have access to municipal Michigan city water. So uh, basically, right, NIPSCO and those entities, entities involved came in and drew a line, right, within the town, you get water, you don't. Um, and so that those that without, were without the water were outside of what they called the contamination plume, right? And so there are still many that are without uh, municipal water, so they still, uh, drink right from their groundwater. We know, right, that contamination has a mind of its own. It doesn't just stop in one place, right? It's not stagnant. And so there's real concerns about uh, what's happening there. And really, again, it needs to come from the community to make these demands. And we're really working with residents like Kathy Murray um, and others, um, Phyllis Demota and so on, who have been impacted by um, a fight that, I mean, they paved the way a number of years ago around this. And they're the reason why they even got a super fun, an alternative super fund designation within the town of Pines um, because EPA was doing nothing at the time and, and the relevant agency. So um, that's a huge injustice and we're trying to change that. I'm gonna give a, a quick overview and then Nikki's gonna go and close us off. Um, this at a, at a glance is why organizing works. And we're gonna be talking kind of about two main things. We did a, a big uh, petition delivery of 30, uh, sorry, 3,000 signatures on our change.org petition that we were able to deliver um, to item as well as with NIPSCO. And through that, we got a big delay um, in the excavation, which we really called for that during the COVID-19 pandemic, understanding that people are especially vulnerable, right? Um, with compromised immunity, understanding what the impacts of having um, additional pollution on top of this pandemic that is still very much ra uh, raging will have right on our communities. And then um, secondly, we also did a screening of in the water. 
And uh, I don't know if we're gonna, we're not gonna have time to play it, but we will definitely encourage for folks to check it out. Um, it's a film by Beth Edwards of the Indiana Environmental Reporter. And we had a big event the other day. So shout out for folks who were in attendance and got to watch the film with us and the Q&A panel. Uh, I think it was a really huge success uh, with everyone that was in attendance and raising awareness about what uh, the legacy of coal ash has been in Indiana and our communities, including um, what it focused on with Town of Pine. So this is organizing works. Uh, we're seeing movement. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Nikki to talk a little bit about leadership and uh, what we're doing now. Okay. And you guys know I like to be um, interactive. So I want you to tell me your name in the chat box and then say, and what are you good at? So my name is Merry Christmas, and I am good at PR, so public relations. I want you to tell me, I am the next person I see is Rosemary. So I want Rosemary to say, I am Rosemary, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and I am good at writing or whatever your magical gift is. Um, and while you guys do that and flood that chat, I just wanna tell you quickly, and I know we're kind of over time. I thank you guys for kind of staying on with us. Organizing works because you bring you why you uh, the the need that you want or the change that you want and your skill sets to the table so that it can you can be used to create the change so ashley is an organizer she's organized with the sierra club she's really great about um you know putting things together and getting all of the pieces together i am really great about um assisting with, you know, media outreach, helping to put together the social media. Um, Nancy, who is also here, thank you so much, Nancy, is really great about um, connecting, um, you know, our political friends, as well as, you know, getting some legislation pushed and passed. Thank you, Dahlia, who, I don't know if she's still on here, but I believe she was, um, who helped to champion and pass some legislation around our Coal Ash Act. Woohoo, Dahlia! Um, thank you so very much um, to help us kind of keep our community safe. Um, so, you know, we bring people. Also, Susan, I know who is on there. She is really great, a really fantastic writer, um, really um, a media mastermind. So she really helps to bring some of her things to the table. Um, and just being able to, you know, kind of connect one by one by one so that we can all get this thing done. Um, and that is why we saw successes with the um, industrial cost shift um, and we saw successes with the petition that we created that got into um, the championed um, legislation by Dahlia, which, you know, the ordinance. So thank you guys so much. Um, it really takes more than one person to really make these things happen. It takes you, in the need for change, wanting the change and being able to bring your skills, talents and abilities to the table with others to create that change. It doesn't matter your political position. It matters that you have people power. So with that, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Ashley. Um, we're going to skip through that. Um, and so this, these are the things that you can actually do to support us. Um, just really quickly, we have a um, legislative toolkit um, at tinyurl.com. Ashley, if you can drop that in the chat, these um, three links in the chat, and you guys can have them. These, um, pr this presentation will be sent over to you. We want you guys to help support us by um, checking out that legislative toolkit, supporting us in the legislative um upcoming legislative sessions, as well as Pat Boyd. Thank you, Pat. Um, and vote, first of all, vote for people who want to see change with how we, um, how Indiana handles coal ash. Vote for people who want to see change in, you know, our environmental and in, in getting rid of some of the food deserts that some of these communities have. You know, vote for people who want to see the change that you really want to have. Um, with that, we also have um, our JTN informational session. You can um, join that or register for that at the tinyurl.com forward slash JTN info session. And you can also email us any direct questions if we can't answer them today or if something pops up later at justtransitionwi at gmail.com. Um, those are for ways that you can support. Next slide, Ashley. Uh, the next thing that you can do, and I want everybody to do this right now, 
go to our Facebook page, go to our Twitter page, go to our Instagram. If you have an account on either one, like us, follow us, say, hey, I'm in for the Just Transition win. Okay, that's what I want to see scrolling down our timelines. You know, I, it's great to hear the thank yous, but, you know, it's really, um, really, really great to see people who want to participate. And another thing that I would like for you guys to do is, um, you know, I also got involved and I know I told you why, um, but I also got involved because I'm part of the um you know, 50 plus percent of Michigan City who are struggling to be, meet their basic needs. I have been, um, and Nancy and Pat knows, I have been or faced homelessness. I have faced um, and overcome a lot of different things. And, you know, through this fight, I have done these things. Uh, so when you talk about what's happening within the Michigan City area, this is um, a fight to help people like me who are really great people in a really great space, but just you know, struggling at this point. We are the people who make up Michigan City. This work requires volunteers and it requires money. So if you can, we would like for you all to at least donate $5 and take five friends to the polls and vote and get some change and help us, help us get, um, continue on with our mission, our vision, and um, use our values to get some um, change for Northwest Indiana and to have a just transition. Dollars, 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 and people, people, people. Billionaires don't need dollars. Broke people need them. <laughs> so with that being said, um, I, there's a few additional pieces of resources that we want you to also tune into on this last slide. Um, and the deltainstitute.org um, program for um, the Brownfields and the Just Transition Fund for understanding a little bit more about um, you know, the Just Transition process and how we get started and things like that. And also the Cl um, Climate Justice Alliance is a really, really great resources for um, you know, what a Just Transition is and how kind of the historical elements of that. So just um, if there's any additional questions or on your own time, if not, I would really, really like to see you guys just jump in, be a part of the team. If you can't be a part of the team because you don't have time, I know you got a $5 or a dime. So thank you ladies so very much for having us. Merry, Merry Christmas. And with that, we open the floor for questions if we have time. Okay, well, first of all, if you go to your reactions, you can hit applause or you can hit a heart. There's a little face there that says reactions. And you see, yeah, you thumbs up. A lot of you got it. There's the applause. Yay. Um, I, uh, Ashley and Latonia, could you make a list of those, all those resources that were on the slides and send them in an email to, to Cheryl or whatever, you know, and, and that way we'll put them on our website you know, like in a list, uh, because there were a lot of great uh, sources there. Uh, Nancy and Barbara, you're up to doing uh, two or three questions. It's already uh, 1237, so maybe till 1245. So for about uh, eight more minutes, Nancy, you want to start? Are you, did I still? Uh, I'm unmuted now. Okay. Yeah. Now um, please um, put questions in the um, chat box if you have any. Um, one from before our 30 minute break had to do with the um, documentary in the water. People were wondering when this is going to become available to the public and how we can access it. If I'm remembering correctly, it needed to be shown at a Canadian film festival um, before it could be released. So if, um, if you would share with us how, how, that, will, how that valuable resource um, can be accessed later. Yeah, we can do that, Nancy. And I, um, I'll ask Beth Edwards too. She, we have an ex, uh, an internal link, and maybe she would give exclusive access to the League of Women Voters to tune in. So I will ask that if um, if anything, it's going to be available likely in another month, um, as you mentioned, after it goes through the the circuit of festivals. Thank but you, Ashley. What they can do is keep up with us on social media, and they will know as soon as we know. There you go. <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> well taken, Nikki. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Well, I would just like to say I'm so glad to see you both again. I've been following you from Michigan City and um, Highland 
And Latanya, you brought me to tears with your speech. You are so passionate about life. I, I love you both. And um, just to follow up, we um, are working in Hammond on a resilience cohort. Laporte did it. Now we're working on Lake County. And um, I don't really have any questions. You guys are just so full of knowledge. It's just like, oh my gosh. But um, I'm sure along the way we will. But um, you've given us so many so many avenues that um, I know we can catch up. And I wasn't in the picture because I had to leave early to take care of my mom, but I was there. <laughs> I, have, I know. I, I have two questions here from um, Corinne. Um, Rakowski, question number one, was a just transition framework included within the Green New Deal? That's question number one. And question number two is, if so, do you think the framework is feasible at the national level as well as at the local level? Ashley, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Corinne. Corinne's my, my good friend um, from Loyola, and it's, it's been a, a hot sec since we've been able to connect, so I'm super happy that she's come on to support me and support our work. Um, with the Green New Deal, um, the Green New Deal isn't necessarily... There's not, the, the problem with, I, and I, I, I totally endorse the Green New Deal. Um, there's, it's still a matter of really operationalizing what the contents um, of the Green New Deal actually entail. And so there's definitely language within the Green New Deal about a just transition. Uh, but in terms of like specifics around it, I know that that's kind of what the Green New Deal lacks. In terms of feasibility for the federal and um, local level, federally, you know, there's been a lot of, because of the Trump administration, there's been a lot of rollbacks, right, uh, largely, including um, the funding towards a just transition. So there's been a, a number of different policy mechanisms that have been gutted uh, under this administration, uh, whether it be um, the Reclamation Act, um, whether it be uh, the Power Act that was enacted under the Obama administration. And so we really need to free up funding for that um, so we can make sure that there is funding available for those communities that it's just not happening. And uh, there is a black lung fund, right, for uh, miners that are impacted um, in the mines every single day. And that's been gutted just immensely. It is a travesty that those miners going to work for decades upon end that have since developed black lung because of their occupation are not seeing justice, are not being funded to be able to adequately afford, you know, their health insurance to be able to go in for treatments. And so that's something also that needs to be invested in. Um, you know, it's again, just transition is just a, a very big framework, but that, I mean, those are some examples of what needs to happen. And locally, it really is a community by community thing. I mean, as, as we mentioned, there, we have templates, we have uh, things to look towards, such as what you saw with Tanawanda, with uh, the town in Germany, within, um, you know, what, what we touched about with various different things, even in Chicago, if, if y'all are, are familiar with um, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, they've been fighting for a just transition since day one. Unfortunately, they now have a warehouse that's coming in under Helco Industries um, in the place of where, where their coal plant um, once was. Uh, but they've they've gone into very extensive you know visioning sessions and things to be able to call for a just transition. So the fight is not over. Um, but I just think it, it varies from community to community. I think it's possible. I absolutely think it's possible. Um, but you know again, it really just depends. And it, hopefully, we gave some good examples of what that can look like locally. Nikki, Barbara, do you Barbara, do you want to ask the next question? I don't have any more. Okay, um, amaz um, amazing work by your group. Would community solar be part of a just transition project? Uh, I, I wanna jump on that one. Um, so 
Yes, it will definitely be um, a part of a um, just transition pro project. Actually, the NAACP is working. Um, we have a soul power project that we are putting together right now that, um, you know, we've taken a look at um, parts of our community that have um, low lit areas to be able to and that are also kind of um, maybe high crime areas and we want to be able to put solar community within those areas. And so we're trying to um, put together the funding and create the sources of funding. So if you ladies know of organizations that may be um, interested in supporting um, the Soul Power Project. And uh, another portion of that is also looking into um, doing energy efficiency within some of these homes because as we're talking about you know the coal ash is just one portion of the work but thinking about how many people again understanding that michigan city and jasper county um, are low income communities and they're struggling to meet their basic needs so um, you are seeing a lot of um families and households that are struggling to pay their energy bill. The um, NAACP also just did a hand up, not a handout program, which is actually still going on, where we're paying um, in response to the governor's moratorium, we're paying um, up to $300 to individuals um, utility bills. And this is across the state. And I will tell you as the person who is managing the program that, um, I, that I've seen a bill as small as $50, but the, I've seen bills over $2,000. Um, these people are struggling. Um, disconnection notices for over half. We I've sent out about 40 applications. Um, we were the only ones at the time who was actually had any funding. Salvation Army, Community Action Agency were all sending people um, directly to the NAACP across the state because there was no funding. We reached out to um, receive additional funding. The Michigan City branch did get some additional funding from Indiana Black Expo. Um, and, you know, with that, it's still not enough money um, where you're seeing a lot of these people who are struggling. Um, you're seeing a lot of people who are impacted with, with health issues. So yes, um, to answer the question, um, solar is definitely a part of, you know, our future um, as Just Transition is a, a major partner with the NAACP. Okay, um, Nikki, as a point of clarification, those um, the, the solar project you're doing is actually for um, solar powered street lights correctly in those um, low visibility areas? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, we are now at um, 1245 and this is the additional time that Rosemary gave us for asking questions. Um, Ashley and Nikki, thank you so very much for your most dynamic and empowering um, presentation. Also, the question came, are you members of the League of Women Voters? And if you're not, as a reciprocal um, gesture, I am willing to help you become members if you would like to join this most awesome group um, and become part of the LaPorte County chapter. Just let me know that. And, um, and I will make that happen for you. So thank you. Thank you guys so much for having us. I really, really appreciate you guys. Um, you guys are an awesome group. I am not a member yet of the League of Women Voters, but I would definitely love to um, you know, support, be a part of it. And also I would like your support in possibly hiring me to do some of your public relations for some of the programs or things or legislation that you want to come to pass. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm looking forward to working with you all to bring about that just transition. That's terrific. And uh, Krista, any parting words from our president? I apologize. Um, I I thought I saw Ashley wanting to say something. So Ashley, do you do you have any final statement? Oh no, yeah, Krista, please proceed. I was just saying, ditto. I'm not a member. Oh. I would love to be. Thank you so much, Nancy, for being our angel. <laughs> Hand it over to you, Krista. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to thank you both um, so much for giving us this inspiring presentation. I'm sure you have our our full blown moral support. Um, and I suspect you'll get some other support as well um, from, the, from the members who are on this, uh, this Zoom. 
Um, so thank you so much. And thank you again to everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see some of you back in November for our annual meeting as well. And goodbye, everybody. And thank you for, thank you for coming. <laughs>